For those of you who don't know me, my name is Minaj. I'm in year two, um, and today I'm going to be presenting on upper limb anatomy. So, first week's first, how's year one going? Good. Excited for exams? Stressed? Stressed? Shouldn't be stressed. Don't worry, guys. Remember, if there's one thing you need to learn out of all of these presentations, it doesn't count towards your Z score. So, <laughs> chill out. But today, I'm pretty much I'm going to be going over upper limb anatomy. And um, some of you might have realized, um, I don't think my slides were put onto the normal folder, but that's intentional because a lot of this will be questions. So um, let's get started. Um, there are a couple of things that I want to point out before we get to the bulk of this presentation. Number one is that the anatomy that you guys learn in your anatomy tutorials and the anatomy that you encounter in your actual end of semester exams are usually quite different. And you don't really know that until you get towards your exam. So for us, in semester two last year, we actually had a mid-semester test. So halfway through our semester, we kind of got an idea of the kind of questions we can expect. But you guys obviously haven't really had that. So pretty much the aim of this presentation is to give you guys a taste of what kind of questions you need to expect for upper limb anatomy and just be like mentally prepared for everything that's going to um, come up on the exam. Upper limb anatomy in general isn't too difficult, but pretty much Here's how um, things are going to work. Yeah, subtle Harry Potter Philosopher's Stone. You guys were born by then, right? <laughs> huh? What, what do you mean? Oh, shit. All right, pop down. <laughs> All right, so pretty much I'm going to be assuming that you guys have just like a rudimentary knowledge of both clinical skills and anatomy because what you'll realize in your exam is that they're very, very intertwined and pretty much what's going to happen today is we're going to go over 36 basic questions. They're going to start out quite simple and then get progressively harder. So I'm going to give you about a minute each question to just think about it. The first few will take you less time. As we go on, it might take a bit longer. So let's, let's get started. Question number one. After winning the Tour Championship not too long ago, Tiger Woods' physio notes weakness in his right shoulder medial rotation due to a rotator cuff injury. What muscle has been damaged? Pretty easy. We'll start out with just um, hands up, and then if no one puts their hands up, I'll call on people individually. <laughs> Anyone want to take a punt? Any answers? So? See? So? Close. Anyone else? Was that a D or an A? <laughs> uh, e? Nice. Um, answer is subscapularis. So, D, sorry. It's A. <laughs> My bad. So, pretty much your answer is subscapularis. You guys should know the rotator cuff, it's been done to death. 
um, but pretty much there are four main muscles. Your subscap, you've got your teres minor infraspinatus, as well as your supraspinatus. And it's important to also know what these actually do. So you've probably been told that your rotator cuff pretty much just holds your glenohumeral joint intact. It pretty much makes sure that your arm just doesn't fall off. But um, more than that, there is a couple of important movements that you have to be familiar with. Most notably that your subscapularis is medial rotation, so that's coming inwards. Supraspinatus is abduction, and then your teres minor and infraspinatus both do lateral rotation. So make sure you guys have a decent idea of what each of these muscles does. Pretty simple. Question number two. So, um, after spending too much time in the gym, Justin goes to the GP with shoulder pain. The GP notices weakness on the empty can test and believes it's due to muscular weakness. What muscle has been injured? Any ideas? C, everyone's saying C. Supraspinatus, nice. So, empty can test is the one that looks like that. I hope you know that by now. But pretty much that is testing your supraspinatus. And as we learned a couple of slides ago, supraspinatus is pretty much another one of your rotator cuff muscles. As you can see, um, they do come up quite a bit. And it's commonly tested by some of the tests you learned in clean skills. So a really important concept that I also want to like drill home in this presentation is the relationship between anatomy and your clinical skills tests. So empty can test is obviously testing your supraspinatus. Your Hawkins test is testing for ten tendon impingement, which is also usually of the upper part of your scapula and usually supraspinatus. You've also got your painful arc test, which is supraspinatus tendonitis and maybe sometimes your um, deltoid, specifically like your lateral head. And as you can see, that's your picture. You've also got your apprehension test, which is the one where someone's standing like that and you pretty much rotate their shoulder backwards, look for some kind of apprehension on their face. And that pretty much notes um, some kind of dislocation. They'll show it on their face. Um, with your lift off test, which is the one where it's right behind your back, that's testing for your subscap. And then finally, external rotation tests are um, infraspinatus and teres minor. So let's move on to question three. So, um, yeah, Justin remembers a very blurry med ball where he was stabbed in the neck with a fork. <laughs> I don't know where this came from. After mentioning this to the doctor, the GP realizes that it may have instead been a nerve injury. So what nerve roots may have been damaged? Just to remind you, we were talking about the supraspinatus that was injured, and now we're talking about the movement there. So what kind of nerve roots might be causing that kind of movement? <laughs> Any ideas? B? Do I hear B? I hope I hear B. B is correct. So, um, this question I kind of split into two parts because it would be a bit easier to formulate all the steps. But pretty much we're talking about the supraspinatus. And as such, we're talking about the suprascapular nerve, which has its roots from C5, C6. It's pretty much all based on the brachial plexus, which I hope you guys have been taught like quite a number of times in anatomy. Um, a tip that I probably would give to you guys, especially since your um, end of year exam will be very anatomy based, specifically on upper and lower limb. Um, at the very of the start of the exam, what I like to do back in year one was I'd quickly just sketch out the entire brachial plexus at the very start because it's likely that you'll have to refer to it numerous times when it comes to both muscular and nervous system questions. So um, that kind of thing just helps you out throughout the duration of the exam. You have something to refer to, you don't have to stress about it. But pretty much here's a really good diagram for the brachial plexus. It's got literally every single piece of information you're gonna need. 
And as you can see, I've just circled in red the suprascapular nerve, which has a root C5 and C6, and it's pretty much coming off your superior trunk. Easy. So just try and memorize as much of that as you can. I'd recommend, I'd recommend trying to get down all the major chords, um, divisions, um, and terminal branches first, and then work on some of the smaller nerves um, if you do have the time. But work on the stuff that's actually high yield. And here's just a table that kind of um, summarizes some of the nerves as well as what they innovate. Moving on, question four. Um, which of the following bony landmarks does the biceps brachii attach onto? A bit more straightforward. I hear some people saying the answer. Does anyone want to commit? Sorry? B. So B is radial tuberosity. Good job. Um, so anatomy department really loves to emphasize that your biceps does less of this and more of this. So it's doing quite a lot of supination. And as such, it attaches onto your radial tuberosity. Um, an easy way to remember this is that like mechanically your biceps is doing a lot of supination so simply sometimes attaching to the ulna doesn't really allow it to do that moving on um <laughs> roland is unfortunately diagnosed with an aggressive breast cancer and his doctor fears metastasis what location is breast cancer most likely to metastasize to first now just letting you guys know this question isn't very high yield i just thought i'd cover it because it did come up in your anatomy um, like textbook. So if you guys have don't have an idea, that's completely fine as well. Any answers? D? Good, auxiliary lymph nodes. So pretty much just straight up memorize that. When it comes to breast cancers, it's quite um, common for your cancers to metastasize to the nearby lymphatics, which are usually the um, first place you check. And as you guys will learn next year, one of the most important components of a breast exam is to make sure you check all the lymph nodes in the auxiliary kind of area. So moving on, question number six. Um, while zigzagging in New Zealand, Charlotte goes skiing and unfortunately suffers from a mid shaft humeral fracture. Which of these nerves is most likely to be injured? Any answers? C? Good. So it is your radial nerve, which pretty much runs right behind your humerus along the radial groove, and that's most commonly injured during your mid shaft tumor fractures. <coughs> it's meant to say nerve, sorry. Um, but pretty much, you literally just have to know some of your major fractures. Moving on to question seven. So um, Calvin falls off a platform at billboards and injures his arm badly, so he's rushed to hospital. The doctor notes paralysis of his left deltoid. What is the likely cause? Once again, kind of combining clinical skills and anatomy knowledge. Oh, 
Any answers? Bees. Bees? Good. It should be bees. So we do have a surgical neck of the humerus fracture, which is up the top of your humerus, right below your um, the bone socket joint. So pretty much when you have deltoid paralysis, it's your deltoid muscle, which is innervated by your medial circumflex nerve in that area. And then I don't know why it says auxiliary nerve. Sorry, I've made a couple of mistakes here. Um, and that's pretty much the major nerve that is injured during your surgical neck fractures. So, moving on. Um, oh shit. After falling while practicing aerobics, Asuka goes to get his shoulder x-rayed. Given this as a result, what other pathology is he likely to present with? I think I saw someone like whip, so I'm going to assume um, that was an indication for wrist drop. And the answer is yes, wrist drop. Um, pretty much once again, as we talked about before, your mid shaft humerus fracture um, pretty much causes damage to your radial nerve. And as such, you experience wrist drop because you lose ability of your extensors. Oh, <laughs> sorry, Karan. Um, after developing carpal tunnel syndrome from typing lots of notes, Karan notices weakness in some hand movements. What muscles are most likely to be affected? So carpal tunnel syndrome is also very, very high yield. I recommend it's something that you guys definitely revise. Karan, do you have an answer? See? Nice. So carpal tunnel syndrome is pretty, it's very, very common. Comes up in your exams, it'll come up in hospitals a lot too. Compression of the medial nerve innervates most of your venal muscles. Um, so that is why you get significant thumb weakness. Um, after elbowing Zach in the face, Stevie suffers from a med medial epicondyle fracture. What muscle is likely to be par paralyzed from this injury? Any answers? B? Yeah, um, I see a lot of you guys looking at your own arms and kind of doing movements and stuff. One of the best techniques for anatomy is literally to just see what kind of muscles you can remember and then look at them on your own body if you can. If you don't remember, that's literally the easiest way to do it. And also remember like your myotomes, dances and whatnot. Um, during our exam last year, legit, there would be people just like going like that. <laughs> so it's definitely a very good way to remember. And yes, it is your flexor carpi ulnaris, which is classically your golfer's elbow, also known as medial epicondylitis. And then if your injury is to your extensors, that's called lateral epicondylitis, and that's your tennis elbow. Moving on. So this is also a low yield question, but I thought I'd chuck it in because it was also covered in anatomy. But a patient presents to the GP with a very subtle ulnar claw due to a diabetic neuropathy. Where is degeneration most likely to have occurred? Everyone goes quiet. <laughs> Any answers? I've heard a couple of B's and C's. Anyone? 
See? Nice. So, the reason it's C, abomedial epichondrite, medial epicondyle is pretty much due to the ulnar paradox, which you guys might have heard about during anatomy. So obviously when it comes to your um, ulnar claw, it's obviously due to an injury to your ulnar nerve. Now the kind of ulnar claw that the patient presents with can vary depending on the location of the lesion. The reason it's called a paradox is that usually the more proximal the injury, so the closer to your body, you think it would be worse and the presentation would be worse. However, it's actually the opposite when it comes to the ulnar claw. Um, the closer it is pretty much to your wrist, then the more pronounced your ulnar claw is, the further away it is, and the more distal, so like elbow, shoulder, that kind of thing, it's not as pronounced. All right, moving on. After running for MedCamp convener, Zach is shouldered aggressively by Michael and suffers a separated shoulder. What ligament is most likely to be injured? Answers? C? Yeah, I'm hearing a couple Cs. Nice. So, um, the injury is to C, your acromioclavicular ligament. Now, when it comes to shoulder separations, it's a bit different to shoulder dislocations, as I hope that um, was explained to you during your anatomy tutes. Um, when it comes to shoulder separations, it's not usually as severe. And it's usually an injury to a very specific limit, ligament, most commonly your acromioclavicular ligament. Um, you can also have caracoclavicular. However, this has to be in a very, very severe case. And um, so it's unlikely that you also had your CC joint um, implicated. It's most likely going to be your AC ligament. So remember when it comes to anatomy, you're always looking for the most likely answer, not necessarily just the correct ones, because there might be a few very misleading questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> after getting stabbed at her public school, um, Anna heads to the hospital. The doctor believes her long thoracic nerve may have been damaged. What test can confirm this? Anyone have an answer? D. Beautiful. D. Wing scapula. So, um, long thoracic nerve is pretty much um, innervating your serratus anterior, and that's the main muscle that it innervates. And your serratus anterior is responsible for scapular protraction. So protraction is pretty much moving the scapula in kind of that forward motion. Um, weakness of your serratus anterior is usually due to either muscular damage to the muscle itself, or more commonly to the long thoracic nerve, and you get winging of the scapula. And the test is pretty much you have someone push a hand against a wall and you're able to see their scapula literally come out of your back. It's really kind of like freaky to see this in real life, but um, it's a very important one to know because anatomy department also loves to just draw that in. Moving on. So question 14. <laughs> After studying until 3 a.m. on nine consecutive nights, Coleman notices a lump on the back of his elbow. What structure is the most likely cause of the lump? Coben, do you have an answer? <laughs> e? Nice. So, we're talking about student's elbow or olecranon bursitis. This is another common um, injury that is usually taught in this like triad of lateral epicondylitis, medial epicondylitis, and your olecranon bursitis. So that's your student's elbow, golfer's elbow, and tennis elbow. These three are reasonably important, and just remember if you usually have a scenario with a student or someone who's like leaning on their um, elbows or has a sudden blow to their elbow, you're going to get olecranon bursitis, which is just inflammation of the bursa. Moving on. Um, question 15. A mother violently pulls on a child's arm at the MNHS open day to pull her towards the medicine stall. <laughs> Afterwards, the child is unable to strain her forearm. What ligament is most likely to be damaged? I've been at two open days and like, this happens. Not the injury, but mother's pulling her kids. Oh. Even answer? 
All right, so we just had E up the front, and that's the correct answer. E is your annular ligament. It's a, re it's a relatively uncommon one, however. Um, the pulled elbow injury was covered in anatomy tutorials, so um, it's kind of important for the specific ligament to be named, and it's your annular ligament, which is pretty much found in your cubital fossa, and it holds the kind of elbow joint in place. So when you have a dislocation, which is most commonly your radial dislocation, um, it involves your annular ligament. And there's very like hilarious videos of um, pediatric doctors in hospitals pretty much just bending a kid's like arm and putting the radial um, dislocation like at ease. They, you can literally fix it by bending your arm and like twisting in a certain direction. So that's just like for your own interest. But we'll move on. Um, <laughs> After hearing about the Z source changes, Richard falls on the floor in shock and unfortunately injures his hand. An x-ray was taken to confirm the diagnosis and which of the following is correct about Richard's injury? This is also pretty high yield anatomy. I think I hear a lot of people say scaphoid, which is... Anyone committing to an answer? A? Beautiful. A. So, as you guys know with the scaphoid, it pretty much only has a very, very specific blood supply. Um, and when you have an injured um, scaphoid bone, it's very important that you have follow-up appointments. So, every like few days and then up to two weeks, patients who have a scaphoid injury need to be checked up on. Because in a short period of time, your scaphoid can pretty much lose all blood supply and just um, become necrosed within your hand. And you tend to lose quite a lot of motion because the scaphoid is one of the major bones that kind of, um, that's connected to your arm radius, sorry. So it's very important that you guys remember this specific fracture. Move on to question 17. <laughs> um, do you do lots of heavy lifting and diving? Geordie has developed thoracic outlet syndrome. What structure is least likely to be affected by this diagnosis? This question is kind of hard, but it was included in your anatomy books as well, so that's why I think it's important that we cover it. Um, anyone have any answers? Any answers at all? I think I hear an A. I'm going to go with it. A is the teres minor muscle, and that is correct. So when you have thoracic outlet syndrome, we're specifically talking about the thoracic inlet, which is kind of confusing. It's a huge misnomer. I don't know why it's called thoracic outlet syndrome, but it's important for you guys to remember that it's towards the apex of your lungs and towards the top part of your ribcage. Um, thoracic outlet syndrome pretty much occurs when you have arteries, veins, and nerves in that kind of passageway becoming impinged. So as you remember, you have your subclavians as well as um, some of the more proximal components of your... Um, brachial plexus traveling through this area, and sometimes they can be impinged in various locations, more, more, notable, more notably by your cervical ribs, which is a congenital de deformity, or in some cases something like a pancos tumor, which you'll learn about next year, or a break in your clavicle. So that is usually what causes some kind of impingement there, and that is thoracic outlet syndrome. Moving on. Question 18. Um, while at the doctor for thoracic outlet syndrome, the, doc, the GP sorry, notices a positile mass underneath Geordie's axilla. Sorry, Geordie. Um, his hand has also started going numb. <laughs> what structure is likely causing this? So this is also a follow-up of the last question. Any ideas? <laughs> All right, so
When it comes to um, pulsatile masses, what does this usually indicate? What kind of structure is usually affected with pulsatile mass? Arteries, perfect. So pulsatile masses are classically arteries. The most notable ones are your popliteal artery aneurysms and also auxiliary artery aneurysms. So um, pretty much an auxiliary artery ane aneurysm is caused by some kind of change to either the endothelium of your artery or pretty much some kind of impingement, which can pretty much cause um, lots of blood to pool in a specific area. And you get a very classical pulsatile mass that's usually somewhat red. And that's what an aneurysm can look like in the area. Moving on. While partying hard, Dana falls on the dance floor on an outstretched hand. She's rushed to the hospital with a suspected fracture. Which of these is the most likely scenario? What was the answer? <laughs> Collie's, nice. So up the front we had D, Collie's fracture. The two most important fractures of your radius are Collie's fracture and Smith's fracture. And the very common consequences of a foosh. So the main things you guys should remember about a foosh, full and astral hand, is scaphoid fractures and then Collie's and Smith's, which are radial. Now, both are distal radial fractures, and in Collie's fracture, your um, distal structures are pretty much displaced posteriorly, while in Smith's, your distal structures are displaced anteriorly. So we're pretty much just all talking about radial um, injuries, and it's all due to Fouche injuries. Moving on to question 20. Um, after successfully winning one too many boat races, Finn trips over and lands on his neck. From then on, he's unable to skull due to having a waiter's tip arm position and being diagnosed with Herb's palsy. What nerve roots are likely to be damaged? C? Good. C5, C6. Nice. Good job, guys. So C5, C6 are the typical nerve roots that are injured during Herb's palsy. And Herb's palsy pretty much is a common occurrence when you have an excessive angle between your neck and shoulder. So when you have this kind of injury, you get what's called the waiter's tip position. And it's kind of hard to infer what a waiter's tip means, but it's pretty much when your arm is locked in um, an extension like that. Sorry, you've lost extension, so it's locked in kind of like a flexion like that. So you have loss of biceps, brachii, and brachialis, as well as unopposed medial rotation of the humerus. This is a pretty specific pathology, so I recommend you guys just commit it to memory. And then um, just remember that the main nerve roots impinged are five and six. Moving on. Um, I was running out of names at this point, so... Question 21. Over the last few months, Sir John Monash has been experiencing numbness and tingling over his thumb and pointer and part of the ring finger on his right hand. This is worse at night. He consults a GP about this and the symptoms are replicated when the GP taps over the middle of the palmar aspect of his right wrist. Which other examination finding is also likely to be seen? This is a pretty long question, but it is very possible that you guys get um, something like this, which has a few little instances of trying to throw you guys off the correct answer. What do you guys think the diagnosis is? Carpal tunnel? Nice. Very good. Anyone want to hazard a guess? B? B. <laughs> Answer is B, inability to flex his index finger. Um, so as you guys obviously knew, the diagnosis was carpal tunnel syndrome, which is a palsy of your median nerve. And it's important that you guys remember what muscles of the hand are innervated by what nerve. So um, what's an easy way to remember what the median nerve kind of innervates? Half loaf? Nice. Yeah. So half loaf is a classic way that your anatomy tutors would teach you to um, remember what the median nerve does in the hand. So um, the best way to kind of work this out is by pretty much logic and kind of um, uh, process of elimination. So extending your distal interphalangeal and proximal interphalangeal joints are done by your superficial and profundus um, extensor digitorums. So we can pretty much rule out some of the intrinsic muscles of the hand. Answer B is quite viable because um, 
metacarpo phalangeal flexion requires your lumbricals. So remember your lumbricals are pretty much doing that, that kind of motion. Next test is Froman's test, which checks for ulnar nerve palsy. And finally, bum extension is done by your extensor pollicis, which is not really in that kind of zone and is innervated by um, the radial nerve, I believe. Moving on, question 22. Um, after a severe rugby injury playing for the esteemed St. Kevin's first 15, Aiden's arm is put under anesthetic. He's not able to oppose the tip of his thumb to the tip of his index finger, as in making the okay sign, but he is able to touch the tips of his ring and little fingers to the pad of his thumb. What nerve has most likely been injured? Now, this is reasonably like confusing in terms of wording, but it's um, actually taken from Gray's anatomy questions. So it's quite popular, and it's important to kind of visualize the clinical aspect of this. So Aiden can't make this shape, but he is able to touch the pads of his fingers together. Does that make sense? I'm taking that as a yes. So, our oh, ring, same, same, still does the same thing. Anyone have an answer? Sorry? Eh? Close. What was that? I'm hearing a very like broad spectrum. D? D? Yes? D? Yes? No? All right. So this is a reasonably tough question, and it was meant to be. Um, the answer is D, which is your anterior interosseous nerve. It's not taught too much in anatomy, but it's important that you guys know some of the branches um, that occur in your um, forearm. So notable ones are your anterior and posterior interossei. Pretty much when you know what nerve innervates what muscle in the hand um, is very, very helpful. And it's tough to memorize them all. So it's important that you guys use techniques such as half loaf to kind of get a general idea. But when you have an inability to create an okay shape, this usually indicates a median nerve pathology. However, in the question, Aiden was able to touch the pads of his thumbs and fingers together. So this means that your lumbricals are still able to do this kind of motion. Yeah, any questions? Are you guys following? Yeah, I'll take that as a yes. All right, so next we have to move on to what the possible cause could be if it isn't the median nerve in your hand. What kind of does that kind of motion in your fingers? What bends your fingers like that? <coughs> Good, so we're talking about your digitorums here. And your digitorums are located in your forearm, and this is innervated by your anterior interosseous branch of the median nerve. The reason that your answer wasn't median nerve was pretty much just because your lumbricals could work. Does that make sense why it was this specific branch? Yeah? So for those of you who are saying no, pretty much let's say you have a long median nerve and it's innervating your hand, and that's innervating your lumbricals. However, the bending is from your anterior interosseous branch, which branches off. So if you have a cut in your anterior interosseous branch, the rest of your median is still going to be able to work. Make sense? Yeah? Good. All right. Question number 23. After a rough tackle in a game of footy, Paddy unfortunately experiences tingling in his right arm. When asked to abduct his upper limb to 90 degrees and to maintain this position while repeatedly closing and opening his hands, Paddy's symptoms are reproduced along the medial border of his limb, from the axilla down to the hand. So which nerve structure is most likely to be compressed? Once again, a hard question. So whenever you guys are in trouble, I recommend just process of elimination to try and rule out questions that might not work. Any answers? I think I heard someone say D. 
D? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> D it is. So here we're talking about thoracic outlet syndrome once again, specifically the inferior trunk of a brachial plexus. What's important here is that the diagnosis doesn't matter too much. It's pretty much the symptoms that we're talking about. Um, you've got pain radiating from the axilla distally, and thus the injury must pretty much be more proximal than the axilla. If you've got pain along this entire length of arm, you can't have an injury here, because what about the rest of it, all right? So you have to kind of think logically in that sense and try and work out the most likely location of a lesion. And then between the other answers, so between D and E, because you've been able to rule out A, B, and C, the correct answer has to be um, D, the inferior trunk of the brachial plexus. So what roots are we talking about if we're looking at the inferior trunk? Brachial plexus, um, there we go. So we're talking about C, A, and T1. And when it comes to your actual arm, talking about dermatomes, where are C, A, and T1 located? The medial aspect of your arm. Does that make sense? So if you're having tingling along the medial aspect of your arm, your mind should go straight to dermatomes because it's kind of a skin um, pathology. And when you think about dermatomes, you guys know that C8 and T1 are located in the medial aspect. Now, when you think back to your brachial plexus and relate that back, you've got C8 and T1, and we're talking about the inferior trunk. So what I'm trying to get you guys to understand is that a lot of these questions have multiple steps. You have to use multiple like little chunks of knowledge from various aspects such as musculature, neurology, even like skeletal system sometimes, and try and put them together in a logical flow to work out the best answer. And that's really key to a lot of difficult anatomy questions. Um, question 24. After having trouble buttoning his pristine white shirts, Ying Tong visits his GP. Examination reveals that he can still grip a sheet of paper between his second and third fingers and that there is no sensory deficit in the hand. Which nerve has been affected? So once again, this kind of question requires some lateral thinking. Any answers? Anyone? E. So I'll explain this as best as I can. Pretty much, Ying Tong's having trouble buttoning his shirts. What do you need to button your shirts? You need fingers and a thumb, yeah? Yeah, good. So when it comes to gripping a sheet of paper between his second and third fingers, so like that, you, there's pretty much no deficit in the musculature there. So he's able to kind of move his fingers about. But what's the other thing you need to button the shirt? You need a thumb, yeah? So what innovates your thumb? The median nerve, specifically the recurrent branch of the median nerve. So this is another innovation question. I hope you guys are kind of realizing the trend here. Innovation is very, very important. When it comes to clinical skills knowledge, you kind of have to be able to relate the two once again. And the ability to abduct your fingers is pretty much dependent on your dorsal interossei muscles. So gripping a paper between second and third is talking about those. But you also need thumbs to button the shirt. And your thumb is specifically innervated by the recurrent branch of the medial nerve. Any questions, guys? No? All right. We'll move on. <laughs> so Bowen and Ben Hunt get into a fist fight over memes. After emerging victorious, so sorry, Ben, Bowen complains of intense pain in his hand. Examination reveals that he has weak abduction and adduction of his fingers, but has no difficulty in flexing them. He also has decreased sensation over the palmar surfaces of the fourth and fifth digit. So over there. Which of the following best describes the nature of his injury? I think I heard someone say the answer. Anyone want to commit? A, Guyon's Canal. Nice. So. So. Was that a question? No? Um, we're specifically talking about um, Guyon's canal. And what runs through Guyon's canal? On the nerve, yeah? So Guyon's canal is, once again, another thing like your carpal tunnel. It pretty much houses your um, ulnar nerve while, while the carpal tunnel houses your medium nerve. 
So if you have some kind of compression, you're going to have deficiency in the ulnar nerve distal to your wrist. And it's important to remember that um, when it comes to weaknesses in abduction and adduction, we're talking about interosseous muscles, and these are innervated by your ulnar nerve. And once again, your fourth and fifth, the sensation over these two digits is once again talking about your ulnar nerve. Any questions? Um, why couldn't this be a hook of Sorry? Why could this be a hook of Yeah, because your hook of hamet also houses the ulnar. Yeah. That's a question later, Karan. Stop getting ahead of everyone. <laughs> All right. So, question 26. Compression of a lateral cord of the brachial plexus will most prominently result in reduced sensation in. Any answers? A? So, when it comes to questions like this, and we're talking about sensation, what's the first thing that needs to come into your head? Dermatomes? Good. Dermatomes should be what, like the first concept you think of when we're talking about loss of sensation. And it's really important that you guys kind of understand that flow. So when we're talking about dermatomes and the brachial plexus, um, we're able to kind of narrow down the area which um, is being denervated in this case. So if you have injury to your lateral cord, we're talking about pretty much C5 and 6 and then maybe 7, and that will be more specifically your lateral forearm, so that kind of area. Moving on, question 27. Which of the following tendons is most in contact with the palmar slash volar plate of the proximal interphalangeal joint. Don't tell anyone, but this was like a question on our exam. It's on recording. Any answers? I'm hearing a lot of C's, yeah? C's? Good. All right, so, flexa digitorum superficialis is pretty much the main thing that connects to your um, more proximal interphalangeal joint. The way to remember this is, it's kind of like nitpicky, it's very technical, but faculty has asked this before, which is why I'm including the question. When it comes to your pro um, Flexor digitorum profundus and superficialis. Obviously, your superficialis is more superficial, while your profundus is deeper. However, what happens with your superficialis is that it runs all the way down to your fingers, and then it bifurcates. And it bifurcates so that it can let your profundus run underneath it. So your profundus is actually what does that kind of motion with the very, very tip of your finger, whereas the more proximal interphalangeal joint is done by the superficialis. Make sense? Any questions? Question 28. So, <laughs> everyone hates this. During embryological development, the upper limb buds are innervated by what? This isn't too hard. D's, C's. Any answers? A? Did I hear an A? Was that an A? Good. Alright. So, nobody really likes embryology, but it does come up on the exam sometimes, so that's why I chucked it in. Um, this actually isn't too difficult, because if you think about it, kind of like by breaking down the question, it makes a lot of sense. So C5 to T1 spinal nerves is pretty much your entire brachial plexus, and your brachial plexus is what's innovating your upper limb. And then when we're talking about dorsal or ventral rami, do you guys know what those are? Yeah? So dorsal rami come out of your spinal cord and pretty much innovate your back muscles. So there's usually not too much. Whereas your ventral rami innovate all of your front as well as stuff like your arms, okay? So by breaking the question down like that, you're able to kind of infer that we're specifically talking about ventral rami because we're not talking about your back, not dorsal rami. And then C5 to T1 is your brachial plexus. 
Moving on. Question 29. After seeing a fire meme, Mark tries to make a ring with his index and thumb, but this is what it looks like. He's able to successfully hold a piece of paper between his thumb and index finger bow. Pronation and wrist flexion are weakened. Which of the following nerves is most likely to be affected? Once again, a reasonably tough question. All right, a very tough question. Any answers? E. Close. All right, so this is a little bit similar to a question that we've encountered like a few, like a little while ago. But once again, we're talking about the inability to make an OK sign. He's able to touch the pads of his fingers. So that should make you guys think we're talking about your um, flexor digitorums. All right, now what else is going on? Um, he's able to successfully hold a piece of paper between his thumb and index finger. So he's able to hold a piece of paper like that. <laughs> Which of the following nerves is most likely affected? So the answer is actually C, which is your anterior interosseous, which is beneath the ulna head of the pronator teres. So as I've kind of explained to you, you can see the OK sign, and it's touching the pads of your bum and index finger. And this means that your lumbricals are functional, as we talked about before. However, your flexor digitorum is not working well. So when it comes to the anterior interosseous branch of the median nerve, this is what innovates the radial side of the FDP as well as the pronator. So your pronator obviously pronates. And this is what causes Mark's symptoms. Any questions? This is a pretty tough question because there's a lot of concepts going on and there's a lot of um, signs that you guys see on the examination itself. But once again, I'm just trying to get the mentality into you guys of how you need to relate these concepts together. OK. <laughs> During a massive rave at DEF CON, David accidentally elbows another LB and hurts his elbow. After performing from end sign, David's thumb looks like this. What would be the most likely diagnosis? Once again, this is pretty like a pretty small and very specific kind of diagnosis. However, um, it does come up in your Clint Skills booklet. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Any answers? So pretty much what's going on here is that David is being asked by his GP to grip a piece of paper like this. However, instead of being able to keep his thumb straight down like that, which is a negative sign on the from ends test, his thumb goes up. And you guys, I think you guys would have learned this in clinical skills more so than anatomy, but it does relate quite a bit. So his thumb is unable to stay straight, and it pretty much curves around like that, which indicates some kind of compensation. So what's going on here is we have a medial epicondyle fracture, which damages your what nerve? Ulnar nerve, nice. So this is a very specific test, a very specific sign. Hopefully your clinical skills teachers taught this to you, but positive from end sign pretty much indicates an insufficiency of your adductor pollicis. So if you talk about the bum muscles, remember in the vena kind of area, you've got quite a few muscles going on. All of them are innervated by your recurrent branch of a median nerve, except for the adductor pollicis, which does that kind of movement. That is actually innervated by your ulnar nerve, okay? So your ulnar nerve runs behind the medial epicondyle, and thus it's a medial epicondyle fracture. So classically, when it comes to ferment sign, we're testing for a deficiency of the ulnar nerve. Does that make sense? Yeah? All right. Question 31. Um, after some irresponsible driving, Anna crashes a car and suffers a penetrating wound to the forearm. The median nerve is injured at the entrance of the nerve into the forearm. Which of the following would most likely be apparent when her hand is relaxed?
I'd recommend you guys go about this in terms of um, crisis of immersion. <laughs> Any answers? So I'll just speed through this bit because we're running out of time. All right. So answer here is, I think it's A? Yeah, it is A. So here we have um, a kind of an explanation of the process of elimination. So what's going on here is that um, there's a couple of things you guys need to know. If you're looking at the actual pathology when Anna crashes her car, she has injury to the median nerve at the entrance of the nerve into the forearm. So we're specifically talking about it in this kind of area. So there should be some symptoms happening lower, okay? And if we're talking about the median nerve specifically, we're also kind of um, omitting any extensive pathologies. So thus we're able to get rid of answers D and E, which are pretty much um, indicate indicative of extensive pathologies. Now, for part C, We've got thumb flexion and slightly abducted. So if you have a thumb that's flexed and slightly adducted naturally, so your thumb's naturally kind of like that, it indicates that your extensor pollicis is damaged. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but whenever you have fingers that are too curled naturally, it means that your extensors are damaged. Whereas if you have fingers that are completely outstretched, it means that your flexors are damaged. So it's kind of important to understand that so thus, we're able to get rid of pretty much B and C, and finally, A is your correct answer. Um, I'll be putting all these slides up so they're available to you, so you guys can take a look at these questions in a bit more depth. And please let me know if you have anything else you want to go over. Um, just because we're running low on time, I might just skip ahead to question 34. So after a big night out, Holly was found unconscious on the floor of ABC, apparently after a fall. She was admitted to the hospital, and during physical examination, it was observed that she had unilateral absence of a brachioradialis reflex. Which spinal nerve is primarily responsible? B, C's, B's? B, good, nice. B. Important that you guys know your reflexes, especially for upper limb. The main ones are biceps, triceps, brachioradialis, and fingers. This can be asked in anatomy questions, and it can also come up in CSSEs or OSCEs later on for your upper limb, just being asked what the actual um, nerve roots are. Um, that's a good question. We'll finish these off until the next lecture gets here. Any ideas? Any, sorry? D, swan neck, nice. All right. So what's going on here is that we have flexion of a metacarpophalangeal joint, so it's lower. Then you've got extension of the proximal interphalangeal joint, which is that one, you can't physically do it. I can't like um, do that for you, sorry. And then finally you have slight flexion of a distal interphalangeal joint, which is a bend here. So we're talking specifically about swan neck deformity, which presents in that kind of shape. And then finally we'll do question 36, last one. Do you, is it a pet skeleton denali? Okay. While going for a walk with a pet skeleton, denali falls over and breaks a fall with her hands. However, she later notices hypothenar pain and difficulty bending her pinky finger. Yeah? Nice. So what's going on here is, once again, you can kind of rule out some of the other pathologies, but we have a hook of hamate fracture. So this is a bit niche, but pretty much what's going on is afterwards, um, when we're talking about the Guyon's canal, a part of the hamate 
is incorporated into that canal itself. And this is specifically the hook of the hammock. You can kind of feel it if you really palpate hard on your um, hand. And if you press hard enough, you'll actually notice that your fingers there start to tingle a little bit. So that's because you're compressing the ulnar nerve. It's a pretty cool way to kind of see anatomy work in real life. But um, essentially, that's what's going on here when you have ulnar nerve damage. So, done. Pretty much, we've covered every single tutorial topic on upper limb. I managed to get away with this revision lecture and not teach you guys anything at all and just ask you questions. So, great job to all of you um, for getting through that because I definitely asked a lot of tough questions. But if there's one thing I kind of want to like drive home, it's that anatomy questions aren't like, what is this muscle? What is this bone? What is this nerve? You don't get anything that nice because that's really not applicable in real life. You're never going to need that knowledge when it comes to clinical years. Patients are going to present with some kind of deformity. Patients are going to present with some kind of pathology or insufficiency. And you're going to be asked what the actual presentation is. What the actual, like what structure has actually been damaged. So that's what the med faculty is really trying to like go over when it comes to your exams. And that's what I hope you guys have been able to get out of the lecture. See you guys at XP. Easy. Oh yeah, no. Yeah. I'd rather just slide the like a little bit more. Oh yeah. more like, oh fuck off. I like going to the top. I like Yeah. Cool. So yeah. Um, are we good to start, guys? Can you guys hear me out the back? All good. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, I'm even second year. Um, gonna do some low limb cue, kind of the same format. I got questions. But I also got like content afterwards. So if you find the questions a bit cooked, wait till you get to the content and I'll explain. Cool. Um, so um, a lot. I, you guys have got a lot of content, yeah? From Lolin? Yeah, cool. Um, so hopefully this should be pretty straightforward. Um, that was the mark breakdown from last year's EOS, or EOI for us. And yeah, as you can see, anatomy was a fair bit. It's about roughly, I don't know, like, 
twenty percent of our mark. So um, getting like a hand hand down on like upper limb, lower limb, and cardio will like really put you in good stead. Okay, um, and that's the contents. So onto pelvis. Start a couple of questions. So, uh, which of these structures pass through the superpiriform foramen? Um, just yell out if you got, got the answer. B. Here, B. Yeah, nice. Okay, so, um, yep, superior gluteal artery, vein, and nerve. Um, and most of the rest of it runs through the um, infrapiriform foramen. Okay, next one. Um, got a bit of radiology to call back. I've been missing radiology. Um, so we're adding these questions up. Squiz. Starting off with something easy. What do you guys reckon? <laughs> nice, pubic synthesis. Cool, yeah. Getting a bit harder. So it's inside um, the hip. So one might call it an internus. And in this case, yeah, I think some, I heard someone say it. So I'll treat it internus. And if that's the internus, what's G? Yeah, I'll treat it internus. Um, the anatomy department likes to screw with us and chuck these on the EOI. Like, no one knows how to do these. So I thought I'd give you guys a bit of a heads up. And I. Um, I is yellow. So it's a very um, nerve. And it's, it's posterior. That gives you any, any clue. Yeah, I heard up there. That is correct. Cool. Did it, that all that like kind of makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. I'll take that as yes. Okay. Okay. Um. So, a man walks into clinic presenting with uh, a drop of his pelvis. So that's towards his left side. So like that. Um. When he lift, when he was asked to lift his um left leg, which of these muscles is most likely to be affected? Did I hear D? D? Yeah? Okay. So um, your so if you drop to your left, um, that'll mean that it's damage to your right nerve, which is your hip um, abduction. And uh, another correct answer here would have been right gluteus minimus, but like that's not on there. Okay. Uh, King Jaffe was in placement at Box Hill. And they were asked to perform a gluteal intramuscular injection. Of course, like, they learned this in the CBA like two weeks ago. Jumped out the opportunity. Unfortunately, they injected the wrong quadrant and damaged the side of that. So the question is, which quadrant should they have been aiming for? And what motor functions would the patient now not able to be performed? Uh, so I think I heard B. It's B, like what people are generally saying. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So it's um. The superlateral quadrant that they should be aiming for, and a quick like way to learn which nerves do what. So the posterior, your hamstrings, that's all knee flexion. Your sciatic nerves at the back, so flexion, and at the front. Um, do you guys know what an extensor nerve is? Emerald. 
Yeah, <laughs> don't all know. Okay, and your adductors. Oh, sure enough. Yeah, so medial compartment, anterior compartment, and your posterior compartment. Okay, patient presented to the ED after a high speed car crash. Uh, X rays were formed to reveal the femoral head lying posterior and superior to the acetabulum. Acetabulum is like the hip joint thing. Uh, what would the patient's leg appear like on examination? And for a bonus, what type of hip dislocation is this? I think I had a C from around over here. Um, could I get a bonus question answer? So what type of hip dislocation is it? Yeah, let's see. Uh, and it's a posterior hip dislocation. I think Minaj was saying, um, so your shoulder most likely dislocates anteriorly, your hip most likely dislocates posteriorly. And why that um, posterior it like becomes adducted and internally rotated because of the humeral head getting out of um, the femoral head getting out of the way and uh, forming that hip, the thigh is out of shape. Um, any questions so far? Everything pretty straightforward, familiar, hopefully. Okay, so same guy. Upon further investigation, it was discovered that um, the posterior dislocated hip had caused a head of femur fracture. Which of these arteries is most likely to have been affected? And what major complication does this pose? What's the answer, Grant? E. So, did you say E? Yeah? Cool. Um, so it's your medial circumflex artery. Um, and yeah, it's avascular necrosis. Um, pretty much anything that's in a closed space and only has like one source of blood supply, if you include that one source of blood supply, that's going to necrosis. So you escape by, you have any femur. Um, and I was always got confused between medial and lateral circumflex artery. Um, I went on and Google searched this this morning. Uh, the median circumflex artery that runs in between the femur and the hip, so it makes sense that that would be occluded. Whereas your lateral, as the name suggests, runs laterally to the femur, so that's like out of way, won't get affected. Okay, so running quickly through um, the, the pelvis. Um, it's made up of the ischium, ilium, and pubis. These are the important bone landmarks that you need to learn. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, sacrum coccyx, they exist. Um, do you guys have a bone and spine, back and spine lecture? I'm pretty sure. Um, they'll go through it in more detail. Just know what, what runs where. Uh, the ligaments are pretty important. So the sacred spinous and the sacred tuberous, they're what make up the greater and lesser sciatic foramen. Um, and they're all, to, they're all to do it like supporting the hip and making sure things don't fuck up. Okay, so the inguinal ligament. The key thing to remember here is navel. That's your acronym. You guys have heard of that? Yeah. Um, femoral nerve, femoral artery, femoral vein. Like pretty much everything in the world runs like in a neurovascular bundle like nerve, artery, vein. Um, and there's also your empty space and your lymphatics, which run by the femoral canal. Um, know your boundaries and your borders and the contents, pretty key. Okay, um, here we are back to the foramen. So superior gluteal nerve runs superiorly in the piriform foramen, and the inferior one goes to the infrafemoral foramen. Um, you can also see that the pudendal nerve I mentioned twice, so in the greater sciatic and the lesser sciatic foramens, and that's purely because it goes in and comes out and dips into the pelvic cavity. 
um, and you'll learn more about that next year. Oh, by the way, congrats on finishing first year. It's a pass. Um, arguably the harder year. Okay. Um, nothing else of importance here, I don't think. So we'll move on. Um, of Chirota Canal, heard of it? Yeah, pretty important. Like, um, know the borders, you know, Pectineal. Um, there's not really any exam questions that can come out of here, apart from like the contents maybe. Um, yep, muscles, here you are. Um, there's gluteus maximus and the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus. And people often forget about this, but the tensor fasciolata also exists. And that is also, um, like, it also sits in abduction and stuff. Um, so they're all innervated by the superior gluteal nerve and the inferior gluteal nerve. Um, and like, it's important to know the attachments because you can get assessed on it, even though it's a pain. And like, to be honest, I never learned the attachments and like, I just pop them up, you know? <laughs> it's not too bad. <laughs> um, okay, and you have your deep uh, muscles. And those are your piriformis, your obturator internus, and your gemelli, whatever they are, and your quadratus femoris. Uh, like, Basically, just know that they're the lateral rotators of the hip joint. Um, yeah, like, not much importance. The piriformis can compress the sciatic nerve. That's how you get piriformis syndrome. Okay, vascular chart. I'll be hammering this one at home, like, most of, but each, like, each compartment has the arteries and stuff in it. And, like, basically, femoral, so you got your abdominal aorta. It bifurcates into the common iliacs, and the common iliacs bifurcate into the internal and external um, iliacs, and then the external iliac becomes a femoral artery, whereas the internal iliac, because it's inside, so medial, becomes the obturator artery, and the femoral artery that goes down into the popliteal fossa and becomes guess what the popliteal artery, and then that goes down into the tibia, becomes the anterior posterior tibial arteries, so forth and so on. Um, kind of like, just know it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, know that the abdominal aorta bifurcates at L4 into the common iliac arteries, whereas the common iliac veins converge to the IPC at L5. So you know, that's the same thing. And the uh, anatomy department likes to pick on this and make a uh, sneaky little multiple choice about it. Okay, um, nerves. The ones in red, I recommend knowing. Um, like, it's not like the brachial plexus. They're not all accessible. Um, if you are like super gun, learn the spinal nerve roots. Like, obturated nerve and femoral nerve are pretty easy. They're the same thing, L234. <coughs> Um, and I'd reckon pudendal nerve also, S234. But apart from that, like, just know what they innovate, I guess. Okay, pathologies. You guys have all heard of sciatica? It's a pain. It's a literal pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> 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 oh, I'm funny. Um, yeah, it can cause spirobalgic discs. Learn that in the back of the spine. Okay, superior gluteal nerve, high, high yield, Trent Dellenberg sign, and of course, gluteal injections, just know, upper, outer quadrant. I was trying to be cheeky with it, and one super lateral, same thing. Um, femoral hernias, you'll get taught a lot about inguinal hernias next year, but for this year, you'll focus on femoral hernias. Um, just know the boundaries of the femoral canal, and if this follows Reaches those boundaries, you get a hernia. And um, yeah, relatively uncommon, so you'll only ever probably see this in your exam questions. Uh, apart, like the England of Hellings, you actually probably see in the clinic. Gate cycle, do you guys remember this? Yeah, like no one cares. Um, watch that YouTube video, it explained it to me quite well, I guess, but yeah, look, I'm going to skip that. Okay, hip joint. Um, made up of your hip and femur. There's some ligaments attaching stuff. 
and um, pubic femoral, ischia femoral, iliofemoral. Basically, from the ilium to the fem femur, ischium to the femur, pubis to the femur. That's your hip joint. Um, vascular, this is important. We went through this, the medium circumflex <laughs> artery, and that can cause a vascular necrosis. Apart from that, like, there's not much else that there's clinical re relevance in. Uh, hip dislocations, buzzword, car crashes for posterior. Um, and anterior also occurs, but like, you need a shit ton of force behind that in order for it to actually happen. Um, also, you've got congenital dislocations, but that's kind of like a cop out. Like, that can occur with anything. Um, and like, it's pretty uncommon. Okay, moving on to the thigh. More questions. What's this? Come on, guys. Quick, beam up. Cool. Okay, cool. Um, Q. Q, where's Q? Oh, Q is kind of tough. It's a. It's a... Did I hear that? Yeah, cool. Okay. Uh, L? It's the most medial muscle in your thigh. Gracilis? Gracilis? Nice. I is an uh, artery. It's anterior. An anterior compartment. I had femoral. Yeah, femoral artery. And the other artery there as well, like I had no idea what it was, so I mean, we searched it. It was a profunda femoral artery, not really important. Profunda, I think, means deep. Uh, <laughs> okay, has anserinus. Goose foot. Do you guys remember that? What do you people think? Harvey, what's the answer? Yeah? Okay, so Beanie, um, how do you remember this? It's tough. Um, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of ways. I could personally go with GST, like the tax thing. Um, because I'm all, I always been confused with membranosis and tendinosis. Apparently, tendinosis um, is more tendinous muscle, and membranosis is more membranous muscle. But like, whatever. Um, that's what actually makes up the ghost foot, and um, you can feel it. If you pop the feel. Uh, okay. Borders. Which of these is not a border of the femoral triangle? And what runs in the femoral triangle? I had see a lot, but uh, yeah, wait, actually, um, it's C, isn't it? Yeah, my bad. Um, that's C, not not D. Um, so what is D actually? Oh wait, yeah, which of these is not a border? Um, yeah, D is not a border. Um, D is actually part of the floor of the femoral triangle, and what runs in the femoral triangle is that fact, the inguinal ligament. Um, is what, it's from the inguinal ligament and that's shape, the navel part. It keeps running into the femoral triangle. Okay, a man, <laughs> I'm from Bendigo by the way, so there's a lot of farm related ones in here. Um, decided to impress his mates and taught a bull in its pen. And his heel got stuck in the in the muddle in the middle, <laughs> and the bull charged it. Um, there was a loud pop with his knee giving out, pushing his tibia anteriorly, and he presented to the ED with a swollen, extremely painful knee. What is it? D, D and C is the bonus one. Joint capsule is always going to be fucked, whichever way you look at it. Okay, so um, does this is 
explaining or can we move on? Are people G? Okay, nah, yeah, cool, ups, ups, and you guys didn't see that. Uh, yeah, B is, uh, it's the, what's up? Yeah, um, it's a classic John Hughes, uh, it always goes ACL, MCL, and medial meniscus. Um, and that's just the order in which it's most severe. So if you get like a not as bad um, O'Donoghue's, it might just be the ACL gone, but if all three go in quick succession, that's a triad. Popliteal fossa. I had the right answer, B. And why is it not B? Because it doesn't exist. Yeah, good call. <laughs> I had so much fun making these questions. <laughs> yep, okay, another farmer. Kicked in the patella by a cow this time, causing it to dislocate. Um, which is, what's the most likely direction a patella dislocates? Lateral? Uh, yep. Okay. Reasons. So you got your vastus medialis on the middle side, and you got your lateral, all the rest of your quads. So if like if one's gonna win out, it's gotta be your lateral side. And like there's other reasons why it stops it from dislocating. There's like the high um, anterior projection on the lateral side, but that's kind of like you know whatever. Okay. A priest. You may have noticed I changed the bottom slide to a priest now. <laughs> Often prayed in the church, presented with knee pain from having knelt down so much. Damage to what structure is most likely to cause of? Yep, I heard I think the majority of people say E. Yeah? Cool. Um, so that's just a clinical relevance. I think it's called the clergyman's knee or something. Um, and that's where your infrapatella versa is. Differentiate from the nursemaid's knee, which is the prepatella versa. Okay, um, those are the FEMA. Like, no, these are the major bony landmarks just because like, they're relevant in your attachments where different muscle muscles attach to each other. Uh, but apart from that, not really that relevant. Patella, um, it's a new card. It's uh, assess my bone, quite like the piece of form. Um, function, extension, protection. Yeah. Muscles, a uh, shit time. Like, it's a lot to learn, but... Um, <laughs> I'll try to digest that down for you so it's not as intimidating. Um, just learn what the three muscles of the present are. Do we know those? Yep, sartorius, priscillus, and semitendinosus. Um, know that your solus major is the strongest hip flexor. And if you can see in here, um, the iliacus and solus actually start out different, like as different muscles. But when they come and attach into that, um, I think it's called the inferior or the lesser trochanter of the femur, it becomes a source major muscle or the iliopsoas muscle. Yeah, but, and um, that's just a clinical relevance. Like examiners like pinning that. Um, know what muscles make up your quadratus femoris? So your lateralis, intermedialis, and your medialis. And uh, yeah, that's about it. And your perspective. Um, medial compartment. All oh yeah, so as you can see, anterior compartment, all femoral nerve, apart from the one that originates in the back, which is your ant solus major, so anterior rami. Um, 
media nav, all object and nav stuff here, except um, clinical relevance. Your adapter magnus has dual innovation. Um, so that's your adapter part is obturated nerve, hamstring part, to tibial component of sciatic. Just remember sciatic, it's much easier. Um, and um, it has an adapter hiatus in it. You guys would have seen that in um, dissections and stuff. Also, by the way, how's your flag race? Was it super cooked? Because it's like ours was. Okay? Like, was, was it okay? Uh, cool. Uh, ours is completely fast. Okay. Um, yeah, they just know that they adapt with that and that object externus and gracilis have a bit more like a bit more components to it. Also it's super useful, like this is from teaching anatomy. It's super useful knowing like that cross section here. It like marks out your anterior compartment muscles, your um, adductor compartment muscles and your posterior compartment. Like it's just good to know where the tussle sits when doing questions. Okay, posterior compartment. Lastly, tibial portion of sciatic nerve. Tibial portion of sciatic nerve. Tibial portion of sciatic nerve. Okay. Um, part of the first answer is extension of thigh, flexion, extension of hip, flexion of thigh. So hamstring muscles. And there are some pretty pictures. That's culture. We went over this. So your femoral nerve becomes your popliteal, uh, femoral artery becomes your popliteal artery. And your obturator artery is from your internal iliac artery. And that has an anterior branch and a posterior branch. Thanks. Um, you guys know DVTs, yeah? That's the only reason you ever care about veins in lower. In my opinion. But like, I mean, there's varicose veins in your superficial veins. But deep veins, DVTs. That's all you need. Uh, yeah. <coughs> of your thigh, know which regions innovate which, like, are innovated by which nerve. So your obturated nerve, obviously, it's more medial, so would innovate the more medial perspective. Femoral nerve, anterior, innovate your anterior perspective. Side nerve, innovate your posterior um, perspective. Femoral triangle, we went through this. So um, basically, the important thing is I get tricked out over this a lot. The medial border is not the lateral border of the adductor longus, but the medial border of your adductor longus, because uh, yeah, because it's part of the floor, really. Um, and you know, the rest of the body is inguinal ligament, fascia lata, all that jazz. And uh, this is also of clinical significance because some like aneurysms of various arteries. This is like the place where you can like easily access them, or just like go up to the heart and whatnot for shunts through your leg. Adaptive canal, um, it's surprisingly in the adaptive compartment and uh, there's con contents. Uh, yep. Yeah. And it terminates at the hiatus that we just saw, big hole. There's Anserinus, we covered that fair amount. Like, for the amount of questions they have on the pes answer it is, there's surprisingly little that's in there. Like, besides, cool. Yes, that's that. We'll see. Um, apologies, just all the fractures. I think you guys have a good question on this, like all the different spiral fractures, communicated fractures. There'll probably be like one or two questions on this, so worth memorizing. Um, and just know that the femoral artery and nerve can be damaged in a sharp fracture, proximal, your median, medial, oh yeah, median cervical complex artery can be damaged. And um, moving on, you got your femoral nerve. You guys have heard of your saphenous nerve as well? Yeah? Yep. Um, so know what parts um, can be actually like can be compressed or can um, be affected. And know that like, if there's a question to do with like surgery of the saphenous vein, the saphenous nerve, which is in close, close proximity, can also be affected. And that can cause um, like paresthesia to the medial side of the lower leg. Obturator nerve, we covered this. Basically, what it supplies, that there'll be loss of sensation there. 
and you'll be find it difficult to adapt to the thigh. Sadik Nev, we went through that. Um, Sadika went through that. Compartments, the compression syndrome even. Um, look, common in young males, occlusion of the femoral artery, damage to the saphenous nerve. Apart from that, yeah, it's like, you know when some, some dudes like, they gym their vastus medias way more than they do like their hamstrings. And it's just a recipe for disaster. And yeah, you get a lot of compression syndrome. So yeah, keep a healthy balance. Um, Grind strain. Like, just know that this, this needs rice. Most, most muscular studio stuff can be treated with rice. There's no fancy things. Damage to the hamstring. This is what I was talking about. Like, when you got huge quads and like tiny ass hamstrings, this is what will happen. Like, you'll have like a sudden contraction of your quads, stretching the hamstrings, and the hamstrings are weak ass, so like, they will break. Um, this can cause uh, bleeding. And bleeding is always bad because stasis of blood can cause a clot. Um, Avulsion fracture of the shield tuberosity will also occur. And it's just, it'll occur in a different way, but cause the same kind of thing in the end. Um, and yeah, there are different types of um, strains. Knee joint, the hinge joint, um, for flexion, extension, and some rotation. Um, there are two different articulations. Um, yeah, so you need to know all of your ligaments and your meniscus, this guy, even. So, you guys are familiar with your ACLs, PCLs, MCLs, and LCLs, yeah? Yeah? Okay. Um, and your meniscus, they're pretty much like, I'm sure you guys have heard of this before, but shock absorbers. So, like, if you fall on them, they are what increases your stability and absorbs shock. By increasing that surface area to suspend your force. Um, and yeah, they're also joined anteriorly by a small transverse ligament. And as like as you can tell with the adorn here's unhappy try, the medial meniscus attaches to the medial collateral ligament, and that's what um, makes that tear. Um, versa of the knee, not super relevant, like the prepatella and infrapatella. Versus are relevant. It's also relevant to the fact that they can become inflamed and enlarged, and that they're just pain. Um, popliteal fossa, when we went through this, the popliteal nerve does not exist, but the tibial nerve doesn't run through there along with a common fibula nerve, both from the side. Yeah? Um, there's a shit ton of borders in there. Uh, learning, like the medial head, lateral head, synonymous. That's pretty much the only place I remember it is this muscle, this actual row. Uh, yeah, yeah. And these are all the different pathologies. So patellar dislocation, a lot of words, but um, just know that lateral dislocation is more common and there's a number of factors like preventing that said dislocation. So um, there's a preventative action of like the more anterior projection of the lateral femoral condyle. And um, also of note, they're more common in females, and that's attributed to the large hue angle. So, as you can see, like they have wider hips here, so that increases that hue angle, increases the likelihood of your patellar spaghetti if you fuck about with it. Um, there's different deferring treatment, like in regards to if it's a first time thing, it's a recurring thing, kind of thing. So, first time dislocation, you splint it. Second time, pressure or a recurring one, and um, pressure bandage that shit. Um, we have cell fractures, they happen. Um, it, yeah, it's just like it can happen once, twice. It just gets shattered. Um, and just know that like, the stuff around it, what, like verses and stuff. Vascular chart, they might be affected because of the bones, like everywhere. Um, ligament injuries, we learn about these. ACL tears, just like if a sports player stops suddenly and twists something, it's an ACL. If there's a pop, it's definitely an ACL. Um, but apart from that, like MCL tears, it's a lateral blow, so stretching your MCL. 
if it's an LCL, it's a medial cord stretching, um, stretching your LCL. Like all of these are very um, buzzwordy, and if you do a ton of practice questions, you'll be able to pick these like instantly. Okay, um, Valfam or Varfield. Do you guys know how to like what the differences are? Like Valgus, Varus, and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so your valgus is associated with the flexion external rotation, which can cause damage to. It's like basically an unhappy um, triad, but in reverse, almost in reverse. And varfil is your varus, like varus look, and it's to do with flexion and internal rotation this time. And that's LCL, OCL, and lateral meniscus. And you got your I don't know I'm happy to as well. We discussed that. It's more common scene in athletes. Um, Versatis, your housemates, knee, pre patella, bones, favorite position, um, and it's to do with swelling of the anterior aspect of the knee. Virgin's knee, infra patella bursitis, friction between the skin and tibia. Baker cyst. So people get confused with Baker cyst and um, popliteal aneurysm a lot, but the main thing to take out of this is a Baker cyst is uh, a popliteal cyst and it's cold and non pulsatile, whereas a uh, popliteal aneurysm is warm and pulsatile, and that's caused by a swelling of the popliteal artery, so that can cause acute leg ischemia, ischemia meaning like loss of blood, so. Um, yeah, tibial nerve, which runs like in that popliteal fossa, can be compressed, and as you'd expect, everything that the tibial nerve is responsible for, the patient won't be able to do. Um, is there anything else that they can assist? Yeah, it's caused by arthritis, overproduction of synovial fluid, trauma, all that jazz. Leg. Questions? Yeah. Woo! Um, patient, ED. Diagnosis of DVTs. Which of these is sort of potential risk factor for DVTs? And what's the major complication? What are people thinking? E? Yep, E, alcoholism. Um, C, on contraception, on contraception, you learn this in second year. You should probably already know this in first year, but the pill, um, that is a clotting agent. So that increases your likelihood of clots. Immobilization of stasis. Like, basically for DVTs, I just imagine like a young female who just underwent like hip surgery on a plane, so they're immobilized. They had surgery and they're also obese. I don't know. <laughs> and like they are going to get the DVT. And with that DVT, it's going to travel up into their lungs through that pulmonary artery, get stuck in the pulmonary artery, and create a pulmonary embolism. And they're going to need some antithrombolytics to reduce that clot. Compartment syndrome, what's on the sign? I think I had B somewhere. B, yeah. B. Oh, so pulselessness. Pulselessness is the actual correct sign. And yeah, so um, compartment syndrome is when like there's been a hemorrhaging of an artery or something, and it's compressing on everything in that fascia. So in that fascial layer, so all the muscles are getting swollen and swollen, and like it's getting big. Um, and yeah, you just need to cut it open, and that releases all that pressure in there. So yeah, surgery. Okay, a man presented to the ED after accidentally falling off his um, roof after the day the bar results were released. 
He now presents with extreme dorsiflexion of his back foot. White muscle is heavily affected. Um, hint, it's not all of them. It is some of them, though. Uh, okay, so Bonji, the answer. Did you say B, C, and D? I think that, yeah, I heard that. Cool, yeah, dude, you're right. So basically, your calcaneal tendon, Achilles tendon, um, the muscles that attach to that are your superficial posterior, like muscles, soleus, gastrocnemius, plantaris. Plantaris is a bit of a compound because only 90% have that. And um, yeah, also, Z scores, you guys don't get that. We don't get that. It's all good. He didn't really jump. Okay, bones. Like, we only have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to rush past this. Take the tibia. Take the big toe. Um, no dose. Fibula, not as important. It's a weaker one. You can pretty much, like, you can stand with a uh, fibula fracture. You can't stand with a tibial fracture. That's just painful. Muscles of the foot. Um, look. So you got your tibialis anterior at the anterior compartment, and you got your extradigitorum longus, and like they're all so the anterior compartments of your leg, they're all covered by deep fibular nerve. Whereas your lateral compartment of your leg is all superficial fibular nerve, and your posterior compartment of your leg. Are all tibial nerve. So if you remember, like which nerves are responsible for which part and which muscles are actually in the different compartments, you should be pretty G. And like your anterior compartment, that's all to do with extension, quite like your anterior part of your thigh. Um, lateral compartment, eversion of your foot. Um, like what Manoj said before, if you like actually do the movements and like put your fingers or hands over the different um, spots, you can actually feel your muscles contracting and stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, posterior compartment, plantar flexing, flexing your feet and stuff. They're superficial and deep. All tibial nerve stuff. Vasculature, we went through this. Composure artery, into the anterior and posterior tibial arteries and your fibula artery. Just learn the pathway, learn what, what they supply. Uh, aneurysms can happen, you know. Yeah, um, deep veins, DVTs, anterior and posterior. So same name as the arteries, and they basically follow the same pattern as the arteries. Superficial veins, um, I'd say pretty like high yieldy in terms of exam questions. They're always like, which one's which? Um, a great way to know it is great saphenous vein. So which one's bigger, your tibia or your fibula? Tibia, yeah. So your great saphenous vein follows your tibia. And it goes anteromedially, and your small saphenous vein follows a smaller bone, your fibula, and goes posterolaterally behind the lateral malleolus, whereas your great saphenous vein is anterior to the medial malleolus. And also, like it connects, the great saphenous vein connects up with the femoral vein, whereas your small saphenous vein connects up to your posterior vein. Basically, so. nerves. Um, look, we've done this. The, the saphenous nerve provides sensation to your medial leg, sural nerve provides sensation to your posterior lateral leg. Um, tarsal tunnel exists, not as high yield as carpal tunnel, that's a thing. Uh, common fibial nerve gives rise to your sural nerves, and that provides sensation to your lateral side. Pathologies, fractures happen. Um, yeah, there's forced avulsion in fibular fractures, and here's also where you can get an avulsion fracture here. Um, proximal tibia, more um, vulnerable because it's like the less supported. Um, DVTs, we did this, risk factors, the fat, like, overweight, 
surgery, hip replacement, on the pill, on a plane, lady, um, and the major complication is the PE. Varicose veins, like a lot of old people have them. Um, it's very simple treatment, but like people don't know that, so they just live with it. It's pretty fast. Um, yeah, compartment syndrome, the five Ps. That's like what a fasciotomy looks like. It's like a rat. It's like an immediate release. They like feel literally so much better after you cut that open. <laughs> um, pathologies of your fibular nerves. Basically, if you know what the nerves supply, you know what pathologies will happen. Um, also, foot drop. So, common fibular nerve is foot drop, whereas your radial nerve is wrist drop. Uh, also, foot drop for deep fibula. Ankle joints. Um, it's made up of your fibula, uh, tibial, tibia, and talus. How much do you guys know about the foot? Like a lot, not much. If you don't know it much, that's good because like it doesn't get assessed as much. Oh gee. Um, anatomy of the ankle. There's your medial and lateral ligaments moves in one plane. Like that, that. Dorsi and plantar flexion. Um, you can get sprains to your ankles. I think your medial ligament can tear, which is pretty rare. Whereas uh, more likely is your lateral ligament with sprain, where you like you do your ankle, so like a lateral ligament sprain. Then fracture your ankle, like it's not as high yield, so we'll skip over that for time. Um, Weber's classification, I think that was an anatomy quest, like a tutorial question. Um, maybe learn it. Okay, foot. <laughs> Local GP after dropping a brick onto his foot. Some would say on his um, tarsal tunnel. After a thorough history and physical examination, GP diagnoses him with tarsal tunnel syndrome. What examination findings would be expected? And bonus, what major structure is affected? Um, any more, any takers? E, e, yeah. And the major structure, so it's tarsal tunnel, T, tibial, tibial nerve. Yep, so tibial nerve is the only one here that's responsible for the, that muscular, muscle weakness of the abduction and flexion of the toes. Um, and yeah, so just remember your posterior thigh muscles, that's what does that flexion and stuff. The deep ones. Okay, um, this one's a bit like tangential, like out of the box. But yeah, a woman in her seventies presented to the GP for a regular checkup. Upon examination, she had normal motor function in her proximal joints, ankle, hip, like all that jazz, but decreased function in her distal joints. Um, she had a tingling sensation on all her toes. The GP discovered a small ulcer, which she claims to have had for a couple of months, but hasn't noticed. What she got? <laughs> and take us? D? Diabetes? Nice. Um, yeah, this is your classic um, peripheral neuropathy where she can't feel shit. And because she can't feel anything, she's gonna get infections in that. And she's gonna need that cut off. But hopefully not. Um, yeah, diabetes is a big problem. <laughs> okay, bones, they exist. Calcaneus, talus and stuff. Um, not as high yield, just know where they are. Uh, same deal with the hands. They start medial to lateral, one to five, starting it with thumb or your toe. Um, yeah, phalanges, muscles, not going to cover them because they are not, like, they're very, very low yield. And that would be wasting my time and yours. Okay, vascular chart. This is important because in clinical skills, you'll need to um, palpate these to figure out different pulses for your diabetes exams next year. Dorsalis fetus, 
and and posterior tibial. And as the name suggests, it's down on the dorsum of the foot and posterior to the tibia. And I think you can feel them on you right now. They're pretty prominent. Um, veins, again, that is important. Dorsal venous sac follows the same general thing, gets the blood from the dorsal fetus, um, and your medial and lateral plantar veins. I think they also follow your anterior posterior tibial veins, or arteries. Um, like, you see that, um, the picture on the bottom right? That's pretty much the most important thing you need to get out of this. Um, also, there's that tiny little fuck off um, space in between the first and second um, toes, I guess. Like, they ask, they like asking it. I, I have to see, I, I have no idea why. But if you know that diagram, you should be right. Like, don't even bother about the words. Pathologies, fractures, um, due to excessive dorsal flexion and stuff. Um, like, you need a fair bit of force for these ones. Like, I like my example here, when your heels fall into like a hole, like in your camera or something. This will happen. Calcaneus, uh, just think of a crush injury. Like, that's the only way this will become ever clinically relevant. Um, yeah, it can become arthritic pain on eversion, inversion, so like twisting your foot around. A whole lot of multisarsal fractures. Um, they're really not as important as any of the things I've been talking about, so we're going to skip over that for the interest of time. Tarsal tunnel syndrome. Um, apparently, there's an acronym for this, Tiny Dog Tunnel Hunters. I have no idea about this acronym, and like I still don't really care. Like, that's how irrelevant Tarsal Tunnel is. But you might have a question on it, so watch out. Tibial nerves run through it. It basically fucks up anything the tibial nerve has a role in. Um, yeah, so if you know the anatomy of the tibial nerve and what it innervates and what it gives sensation to, you should be right. Median, okay, this is that low yield. Just, nah. Uh, nah. Okay. Um, people have different types of foot, feet, even. Um, high arc, flat foot. People wear orthotics, so your flat feet. Um, I don't know what high arc people do. Just cop it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, this is relevant Achilles tendon rupture. Um, it's by extreme dorsiflexion. Um, it can occur from falling from a great height. Um, or like stepping in the hole. Uh, two. Fun times, yeah? Seven times, my times? Not really. Okay. <laughs> a female presented to ED with a posterior disc herniation between L3 and 4. What movement would she not be able to perform? First up, what nerve is being pinched right now? L3, L2, or L4? L3, yep. So what can't she do? D? D? Cool. Um, so this is just to demonstrate the fact that there is no C8 vertebra. So anything above that? Um, the corresponding spinal nerve root goes above the corresponding vertebra, so C8, 6 is above C8, C6 vertebra, whereas anything below, so your thoracic to your lumbar to your sacral, everything is below one. So your L1 nerve root is below L1, your L2 nerve root is below L2, um, and just learn your, I think there's a funny answer for it, I think, yeah. Okay, um, loss of sensation, anterolateral leg and big toes. What's motor function screwed? So first you need to know what dermatome is screwed. So what's the corresponding myotome that's also screwed? Sorry, this is a bit mean. <laughs> so 
So what's the dermatome? L5? Yep. So what motor function is L5 responsible for? See? Yeah? Knee flexion? Yep, so here you can see um, the anterior lateral leg up there and your big toe. That's all L5. And if you remember your milestone dance and whatnot, you'll know that knee flexion is L4 or 5, I think. Um, yeah, patient presents with a single isolated fracture on the L4, the four, yeah, vertebra, closing the L4, L5 foramen. Um, what's the pain class? The Sherman. Which nerve root? Um, okay, so hands up for A. No one? Okay, hands up for B. Hands up for C. No one? Hands up for D. Yeah. Hands up for E. Okay. Okay. Yeah, um, pretty tough. Uh, these are actually right answer here. Um, like these, I'm just putting these ones out there to make sure that when you get into the exam, you'll be like, oh yeah, this low limb is questions easy compared to like all the shit even throughout me. Um, but yeah, main take home message is what's up? Yeah, leg, not thigh. I not good with words. <laughs> So yeah, these are your dermatomes. Um, oh man, that right, that right one reminds me of bone a lot. Okay, um, yeah, know your dermatomes um, and like where to pinprick and stuff for clean skills. My terms, like there's a dance, there's like the words for it, unimp and shit. Um, I never like actually learned this. But it's probably useful too. And the ego will like actually love you for it. So I recommend it. And like as much as I kick a fuss about it, like it's actually pretty easy. I just didn't get around to it. And uh, finally, here's some important nerves that you need to remember coming back to it. And like I was that person there. I was literally like because back in my time, back in my day. In my day, um, because that my son's called Manon. You guys don't, so like, chill out, don't remember this, like, whatever. Um, good luck, good smash it. Um, any questions? None, cool, enjoy. <laughs> and um, stay around for Matt's amazing mom presentation, it, it'll literally blow your socks off, nothing compares.
Genuinely shocked. I'm super shocked. To be fair though, like, I thought it's a pretty good show. I was just like, oh look, I'm I'm everything makes sense. Right <laughs> so I, was watching, I was watching you like look at the clock and I was like, don't worry bro, it's just HLSD. <laughs> You're like, oh, I better rush. I'm like, don't worry dude, it's all G. <laughs> just, just catch it. Yeah. I thought I just like, let everyone who's going to leave leave. Yeah, yeah, good point. It's awkward, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Trying to yeah. speak over them. Yeah. Oh shit, you can get a mic here as well. Oh yeah, take, take out. What do you think? What do you think? Glenn? <laughs> you <Yeah. laughs> Unlike the last two lectures that you have, it's all been about like, oh, it's like, know how to apply it and all that. Um, HLSD is actually pretty chill. It's not really, you know, when you go to anatomy and you like look at the questions, after studying on the weekend, they still make no sense. So it's like that, but Glenn's pretty fair. Yeah, no, Glenn, right? Like, absolute <coughs> human. So um, it's really just about having actually gone over the content, because everything is just about knowing the different definitions, what things mean, or understanding how different models work. So if you if you like like just memorizing it, then you'll be fine. But there's not really too much difficult applications going to go into it. So there's actually like a fair bit of stuff, but most of it's pretty shallow. So this is just kind of an overview of stuff I'm going to go through. Uh, there's about a thousand theories, so just have a general overview of each one. So you don't really need to go in depth into any of them. Um, and then for all the different um, pathologies and stuff. You'll generally be able to pick them based on feel. Like most of the names are pretty self-explanatory, but we'll get to them as we go. Is <laughs> a death? You had a lecture on it, right? <laughs> um, anyway, so just some basic stuff which you probably heard a thousand times. So nature and nurture, um, you might have written about in that. So you just have that HLSD assignment you lie your way through in you know, like the last week before it's due, and you make up a patient, all that stuff. Um, yeah, so just it's literally just understanding what it is. Um, continuity and uh, it's just about whether or not people go through stages, in which case it's discontinuous, or if it's uh, kind of a gradual shift, which is continuous. And then universal or context specific is the way that people develop. So whether people all end up exactly the same or um, whether they go through different pathways depending on where they are and what they're exposed to. So this is another thing you probably lied your way through this year, either in the HLC assignment or in case comp from first sem. Um, doesn't really matter at all. Uh, again, pretty much just know it exists and know three parts of it, which fortunately are all included in its great name. Um, and here's a quick example you can look at later if you want. It's just an example of how uh, different factors can influence development in something like obesity. You can have genetics, you can have uh, exposures from the family, and you might have stresses that make people eat, things like that. 
Uh, potentially, I guess, a short answer question, but really, you can just make them up as you go. Uh, so then, this is a whole bunch of theories on development, which you should have heard of, um, and you should know at least something about each of them. Always one is probably the least useful. Um, so they never really ask about it. It's the one with the ego, super ego kid. It's really just like basically people do what they want to do. That's all you need to know about it. Ericsson's uh, is a bit of a pain in the ass because there's eight of them. Um, and unfortunately, you do actually have to know them because they'll just ask if someone's in the stage of, I don't know, initiative versus guilt, then what are they feeling? Or they'll give you a vignette and they'll ask you which stage they're in. Um, using the, the ages can be helpful because usually they'll say, you know, it's an old guy or it's a kid or something like that. But again, the names will give you a big clue to what each one means. Uh, operant conditioning, you should have done in first semester, so I'm not really going to go through it that much. But keep in mind, this is end of year by the end of SEM. They could ask you a question about it, but you really should be fine with that. Uh, social learning is a bit different to operant conditioning. So for operant, you're basing how you learn on the, um, what people do to you after you make an action, whereas social learning doesn't require any kind of consequence, whether it's positive or negative. Instead, you basically just copy what you see other people do, which is like a lot of that anyway. So then Piaget's is another one, um, discontinuous. So again, it's set out in different stages. Um, I'm not going to read through all of them, but just give them a read and know what each one means. Uh, ecological, again, not amazing. It's the one with the circles. Um, yeah, pretty much just know the circles. And the further out you go, the further um, each influence is from the person. So the closest ones are the individual ones, like your sex. Then as you go further, you get into family, further you might get into work, and so on and so forth. So having just told you about the different ones they might ask you about, having entered medical school, pretty certain of what he wants to do, Eric's now questioning what future career he wants and whether or not he's suited to or wants the life of a medical professional. So which Ericsson stage might he be in? Yeah, pretty simple, right? Like there's no there's no tricks to them, they just make sense. So should really be fine. Um, newborns and infants, we had like one question on this once, um, and I didn't know it because they didn't actually cover the thing they asked us, so don't stress too much about it. Um, of these, the only one that you really might get asked about is the reflexes, um, and that's the same thing that you just gotta know the names. So, uh, keeping with the lying theme, Babinski reflex, you may remember trying to elicit from other people and inevitably not finding it. Um, the rest of them are pretty straightforward, like blink, you know, close your eyes, or blink. The only ones that are kind of not fitting with their name um, are Moro, which is like when a kid falls and it goes like that, because it doesn't want to fall. Um, and rooting, which is where you like stroke its cheek and toes so that it can feed. Um, and the rest of them I think you can really do based on name. Yeah. Cool. So then just some interesting stuff on the uh, I guess progression of development. Basically, they get a uh, uh, babies grow really quick, so that their weight doubles in three months and triples in a year. Um, systems theory is just about how they learn different skills, so it's the idea of like combining individual skills to make a whole skill, like walking. If you think about all the different steps that go into it, like upper <coughs> movements, lower movements, head movements, it's actually quite a lot going on. Cool. Um, I don't think this is that big a deal, but you can give it a read if you want. It's just about uh, if you have to set out different stages of memory. Um, really, if, when you're looking at what you want to learn for HLSD, um, <coughs> we even put it up earlier, it's eight marks, or it was eight marks for us, which is not huge, but also not nothing. But considering the relative ease of the content compared to something like anatomy, it's worth being all right at it. Um, so you can really tell the kinds of stuff they'll ask you about, because you'll see something like a list with four different parts, like, oh, they could ask me about that, as opposed to something really general about like how people feel. Okay, language. Not super important. Maybe just know about uh, fast mapping, which is uh, from one to two years, and it's where kids basically develop vocab really, really quickly. So it's developed um, at a speed where you can't possibly have thought about every single thing it could mean. So the example is a cat. Um, I don't know if Glenn gave you that example. It's one he used for us. So if someone points to a kid, if, someone, if a kid points to a cat and says cat, it could be the actual thing the cat, it could be the color the cat, it could be a movement it made or it could be the fur on the cat, it could be any of those things. You can't really tell, but it's impossible for them to have basically gone over all those different possibilities um, <coughs> at the age they're at. Cool, so then here's another one, reflexes. So which of these, uh, possibly more than one, 
is not matched with the reflex it represents. Code D is one of them. Any others? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty easy, right? Like, if you know the list, you'll be fine. Okay, over to mid. Um, theory of mind, attachment, okay. So theory of mind is about your ability to understand how you think and how other people think. Um, and again, it's very stage-based. So at two years old, kids understand the link between wanting to do something and doing it. So they understand, I'm hungry, so I want to eat, and that those two things are related. And at three years old, they can differentiate between like what they think and what the outside world is, and realize that they're not the same thing. And then at four years old, they can uh, use thoughts and beliefs to explain their own behavior and also other people's behavior. So have you guys seen this test before? Okay, so this is uh, the false belief test. And the idea of it is your ability to attribute a belief to someone else. So here we've got two people, Sally and Anne. Sally has a marble, which she puts into the basket. And Sally pisses off, and Anne's a bit of a bitch, so she moves the, the marble and puts it in the box. So in the end of it, you're supposed to ask the kids, so then where's Sally going to look for a marble? So the answer is... Yeah, right? So <laughs> not that hard, yeah, because you pass the false belief test. But for, I think it's with autism and a couple of other diseases, basically, if you have problems with this test, it's because you can't attribute the fact that what, um, what the other person believes might not be true. So it's a false belief. Does that make sense? All right. <laughs> Was that a yes or a no? Nobody said it loudly. Does it not make sense? Okay. So, so the, the, true, the true belief here it would be basically from, what's her face's point of view? From Anne's point of view. She knows that it's in the box, right? The false belief would be if you weren't present while this happened, then you would believe that it's inside the basket, right? So the false belief test is testing your ability to know that someone else will have a false belief. Yeah? Sorry, I kind of muddled through it last time. Is that better? Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah, so then you actually go on to attachment. It's again in a whole bunch of stages. So pre attachment is, you know, it's great because there's a lot of numbers which can't go together here. So pre attachment is. Basically, just when the baby can recognize its mother. Then attachment in the making is when they're getting more used to them. True attachment is where they can kind of like use the mother as like a home base. They'll like go away for 10 meters and then be like, oh, I don't like it and come back. And then reciprocal is where they start being really shitty because they're like two or three years old and they know they want things. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then these are a whole bunch of different types. Um, again, a lot of them are very simple based on their name. So secure is that it's good. So um, basically, what they get someone to do is they have the kid and they have the mother. They have the mother to leave, and then they see what the kid does, and they see what the kid does when the mom comes back. So if it's secure attachment, which is basically like the ideal, then when she returns, the, the kid like calms down and then starts goes back to doing what it's doing. Avoidant is where it's kind of like <laughs> still mad at them, so um, it just like ignores the mother when she returns. Uh, resistant is when uh, you know when you have a kid and it like want something to do with mom, the mom's like shh, and it keeps on making noise. That's basically resistant. Um, and then disorganizes where like mom comes back, which is like, what, what do I do? And that's it. Cool. Play, really, it's a waste of time. Um, don't worry about going over that too much. Cooperation, um, really just know, again, these three definitions. So empathy is being able to take others' perspectives into account. Pro-social behavior is any behavior that will benefit someone else, which has the subset of altruism, which is a benefit behavior which only benefits other people. Hey, QBD, oh, this is fun. Yeah, so again, there's not much in these. So physical changes, um, I mean, all of you in theory have gone through them, so you should have some idea of what's happening. Um, maybe not with the numbers, but most of it should make sense. So most of it's pretty steady in the growth spurt. Uh, Slightly offset in time, but they're both the same length of four years. That can help with you remembering it. And then the primary and secondary sexual characteristics are basically just things that you kind of associate with being a guy or being a girl, other than genitals. So the breast, pubic hair, deep voice, things like that. 
Uh, most of that's genetic, but some other stuff like psychosocial stress can also affect it. Cool, and then psychological. Um, so you got basically these areas, hormonal changes, which make people more irritable and impulsive, which you probably experienced. Uh, sexual orientation mostly develops during this part, and then also body image affected differently. And you find this is a common theme with a lot of the different um, areas of HLSD. Males and females tend to develop very differently. So males are more likely to be all about it, be like, man, I can't wait to gym like you do, right? Or you might be like more harsh, which a lot of females tend to struggle with. Um, so the benefits and oh, the pros and cons of development differ quite widely there. Sex and gender, right? So again, it's just a whole bunch of definitions. So I don't want to get like a whole debate about what's what, but just know what each one is. So sex is biological ones, like X, Y, X, 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 X. Uh, which hopefully you did in first sem, as opposed to gender, which is like the social one. Um, and then first definition. So intersex is where it doesn't really fit either side. Uh, transsexual is if you transition from one to the other. And transgender is if the gender identity doesn't fit, but they haven't transitioned yet. Okay, so this is what I was talking about before, about the differences in behaviors. So in general, males tend to be really crap at seeking help when it comes to health. So females are more likely to do it earlier, and they're also more likely to basically do uh, protective behavior, I suppose. Uh, men are also highly overrepresented in suicide rates, um, but diseases like dementia or Alzheimer's, which are more associated with being older, tend to affect women more because they live for longer. Okay, gender typing um, is basically about how kids learn uh, their gender and what, is, what they're supposed to do for their gender. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different ways they do it, but the main ones are operant conditioning. So that can be things like, um, I don't know, if they're like playing with uh, something that's blue or something that's pink, and their parents get mad at them if they're playing the pink one because they shouldn't be. That's operant conditioning. And social learning is by watching other people. So if it's like that thing, you know, where kids see their dad shaving, they go up and go like this, it's really cute, but then like kind of dangerous, they'll cut their face. Like that's the social learning side of things. Cool. Um, the theory I wouldn't really bother with, but if you're interested, it's basically three stages. Again, everything's about stages. Just, yeah. Okay, we're out of kids, onto adults. So all of these are kind of a little bit downers, but get over them. Yeah, so did you guys have a lecture on this? Because we have like a whole lecture on friendship and like all that kind of stuff. Um, it's nice because you've got a nice little acronym here. You've got like, yeah, A, B, C, D. So, really quick one to learn and worth learning. Um, yeah, the, 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 someone said the E. The E for ending is pretty sad, but what can you do? Um, and if you guys think way back to like Craig Hassett and all that, uh, risk factor for poor connectedness includes illness, disability, and unemployment. Obviously, these issues become more pronounced the older people get. They love, they whatever. Um, <laughs> violence and abuse. Um, I don't think it's worth knowing the whole table, but probably just the progression and the way that um, they develop, I suppose. Uh, it's worth having a read over, I think, to have a feel of it, but certainly don't go about like learning each part of that table. Okay, uh, work. Mm. You can do a lot of work, like the work part, by just making it up as you go, because a lot of it, again, is very intuitive. Um, skip that. Unemployment. This is a whole bunch. Basically, again, <coughs> unemployment is bad, so everything associated with it is going to be a bad thing. So the odds of you getting a multi role on it are honestly pretty poor, because one of them will be good and the rest will be bad. It's like hell, like the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sweet. Okay, so this is where we're going to come some of the more interesting stuff. So it's going to be a bit more about um, what the different kind of pathologies are and how they might develop. So the psychodynamic one is the id, super ego, and ego. So id is kind of the pleasure principle. It's like do stuff that makes you feel good. Super ego is about, um, it's meant to be like the, basically be a good kid. And then ego is meant to balance the two. Um, so conflicts between these areas can lead to anxiety. Um, and stuff like denial or like, turning it into an intellectual thing, you're basically just defense mechanisms. Cool. Uh, behavioral. So we've already talked about conditioning. Uh, so classical is basically associating something, um, associating a deviant behavior or a specific response um, with a neutral and unconditioned stimulus. And then social cognitive is seeing up someone else do it. 
Hey. I'm sure everyone's heard of Pavlov's dogs at this point. So sweet. Uh, biological. I don't know if you guys got like a whole list of like a thousand different neurotransmitters that can do it, but don't worry about them too much. Um, serotonin one might be worth knowing because it's very, I guess, well <coughs> documented and people seem to be really into it. But they're more seen as kind of like risk factors rather than a specific causative issue. So then this is worth knowing that um, in terms of the ways that different uh, factors in people's lives lead to different outcomes. So you have multifinality, which is where basically uh, a single initial factor can lead to multiple outcomes, as opposed to equifinality, which is where a whole bunch of different uh, start points, I guess, or different problems people have can end up causing the same issue. So having just gone over that, uh, so Mr. N and Mr. O's parents both divorced when they were only three years old. Mr. N got over it, but Mr. O continued to struggle with attachment issues. On the other hand, Mr. N didn't drink until he was 21, while Mr. O started drinking when he was only 14. At the age of 30, though, both of them now attend Alcoholics Anonymous meetings each month. So, who wants to tell me about molten equifinality? You made eye contact with me. Bad luck. So. Yeah, it's like, it's up. Yeah, so HLC tends to be like pretty heavy handed about a lot of this stuff. So it's not going to be, you know, super complex for you to unravel which way it's going. Um, so as you said, one's equity, one's multi. And, and I guess if you like pictures or you're more of a visual person, basically this is what equity and multi finality are. So the first one is going to be equity finality. You end up with the same result from different predictors as opposed to multifinality for the second, which is going forward from a given predictor, people ending up with different outcomes. Cool. Okay. Uh, these things. All right. So immunization, all you really need to think about for this is about the attitudes that people have to it rather than the biological kind of uh, foundation of it. So basically all you need to know is that anything that you think would probably increase someone's odds of getting vaccinated does. Anything you think doesn't, doesn't. That's about it. Okay, family function. Um, the other might seem like a big circle that had all of these in it. Basically, there's like five parts that this McMaster guy thinks are part of family function. There's communication, problem solving, roles, and different sides of affect. So affect is basically the way that people look like they feel rather than how they say they feel. So if someone's walking around like all dressed in black and they're like, and they have a depressed affect. Um, so it's about how people respond to that and how they're involved in each other's. And the better function is the better people's health outcomes tend to be. Okay, then uh, you guys probably talked about uh, like compliance and non-compliance and how much of a problem that is depending on who people are. So um, I see positive reinforcement can help it by getting people to feel better. If they feel better, then you go, oh, that's good, and they'll be more likely to take it. Or alternatively, they can have negative reinforcement. So if they don't take it, and their wife comes over and they're like, mm, take a medicine. And they're like, all right, I'll take it. Yeah, both of them will increase it. The other one that's important is self efficacy. So it's like people's belief that they'll be able to do it properly. Um, and basically, if they believe they can, they probably can. So, there's a whole bunch of reasons why they might not. Um, again, very intuitive. So, if they don't think it's important, uh, if they don't think that it's worth it considering the costs, if they think it won't work, if they think it's too difficult, uh, they're not careful, or they're just kind of an idiot about medicine. Any of those will basically reduce their odds of adhering. So these are a whole bunch of different things that might reduce people's odds of adhering to medicine. So we've got uh, low SES, illicit drugs, poor social support, uh, some psychological stuff like not believing that it will work or kind of if they don't think the doctor knows what they're doing. And depending on the elders, their age as well, like kids obviously are getting rubbish at it. Yeah. Should be pretty easy. Not all at once. Anyone? Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. Pretty simple. All right. Ah, oh, finally good stuff. All right. So just know some characteristics of each of these. Um, you've probably seen there's quite a long list of um, 
like criteria that you need to fulfill to specifically diagnose someone with a given condition. Just know the general kind of gist of them. You're, like, there's never going to be a question that's going to ask you to list all nine criteria for diagnosing depression or something like that. So just get a feel for what kind of stuff you're looking for. So you should have also have heard about most of these, to be honest. So ADHD, uh, there's issues with attention, impulsivity, and regulating the movements. Uh, more common in guys, and it's generally pretty evident from pretty early on. Um, and it affects friendships because you piss people off because you don't listen to what they're saying. Um, and academic performance because they're just going nuts all the time. Cool. So these are a whole bunch of things that can help as we point you towards it. So hyperactivity, not paying attention. Uh, it needs to be causing for, for everything. Um, a key criteria is that it has to be affecting people's function. So they need to be finding difficulty with work or school or social function, anything like that. Um, and then it has to not be better explained by something else. Also a criteria of every single diagnosis. Yeah, so these are some ideas about what might be causing it. It could be biological, psychosocial, but no one really knows. Delinquency is uh, what it sounds like, so it's people going nuts all the time. So it's illegal, destructive. Um, it depends, it can vary in how long it lasts. So with some can be uh, limited to adolescence, and that's when people kind of go through that rebellious phase. Um, or it can be quite a lifelong thing, which is the is it life course side of things um that can be linked to a whole bunch of factors like crappy supervision being impulsive or SES, or possibly some neurotransmitters again okay treatment and prevention uh basically just find a way to discipline them so it might be getting the kids discipline themselves the teachers to do it um getting them to go to school which is interesting and uh basically just finding better ways to resolve conflict cool so depression. So there's two different forms of or ways of using depression. So you either use this on work, like I'm um, feeling depressed, or it can be the uh, disorder. So you can feel down um, and it's kind of normal. Um, and basically when things like depression or anxiety become uh, abnormal is when they start affecting your ability to do things. So where that means you won't go out or you can't concentrate, things like that. Um, the important ones for uh, depression is that it needs to be have quite a long duration. I don't know if it lasts, but it's quite important. So it needs to last more than, uh, more than a fortnight. And you also need to basically lose um, interest. <laughs> yeah, no, whole semester, right? But um, <laughs> so and it also needs basically needs to be get what's called anhedonia, which is where they don't take pleasure in stuff they used to do. Um, yeah. The causes, again, nobody really knows, a whole bunch of things, don't worry about that. Um, distribution is kind of interesting, so it's rare in childhood and it's more common in adolescence and uh, has a higher lifetime prevalence in females. Uh, poor family function can contribute to it. And then treatment, uh, there's antidepressant medications, which you'll do next year, or there's a whole lot of psychological therapies. Um, the medications are kind of eh, on it, so psychological tends to be a better therapy. Uh, schizophrenia, more interesting. So you've got delusions and hallucinations, uh, negative symptoms, and then the rest of them are kind of similar things. So disturbed function, it needs to last one six months. Uh, these tend to come on a bit later than things like ADHD. So <laughs> it comes on late, I think it's from, both coming from like 15 to 30 uh, years of age, and then it's equally common in both genders. So mentioned delusions and hallucinations. So they sound really similar, but they're two different things. So delusions are things that people believe, and there's a few subtypes. You have somatic, which is where something's being done to you. Uh, grandiose, which is where you think you're awesome. Or persecutory, where you're worried about people coming to get you, uh, talking about your back and so on. Uh, then that's different from hallucination, which is a sensory thing. So whereas one is something that's only inside people's own minds, sensory is something that they think is coming from elsewhere. So it be something that they think they're seeing, they think they're hearing, they think they're feeling, um, which isn't really that. Cool. Okay, yeah, so causes, you're probably noticing a theme here is that nobody knows what causes anything. So uh, there's a genetic component though, because it's far more common in people who have a relative with it, but otherwise everything's just a best guess. Hey, treatment, uh, antipsychotics, uh, they don't work for everything. So a lot of it's psychosocial stuff as well. So that can be stuff like techniques to try and maybe get them to forget about it, uh, give them life, life skills so they can basically care for themselves. 
and also educating those around them so they can help out. Oh, even better, personality disorders. So a whole bunch of these. Um, let's go. All right, so basically every single personality trait is partway along this really long line from abnormal this end to abnormal this end, and everyone's hopefully somewhere in the middle. And basically the further out you go towards each side, the closer you are to being abnormal. Um, so, yeah, so nature and nurture play a part in it because part of it can be stuff that people inherit, and we can see that in how they're more common. Uh, people who have a given disorder um, are more likely to have kids who have it as well. And then things like cultural context can be important too. And the only real example I can think of for that is basically eating. So in a Western, you know, more Western society or in a society that's quite prosperous, then it might be seen as like shameful to eat too much. But if you go somewhere that doesn't get that much food, that's not really a problem. Things like that. Okay, so the clusters, I don't think it's important to remember them in their clusters, like this is a cluster A, this is a cluster B, but they're useful for organizing how you remember them. So uh, for cluster A, they're very much on this kind of schizophrenia style of things. So they're about as you believing or seeing things that aren't there. Uh, paranoid is where exactly what it sounds like, people are paranoid. Schizoid is uh, where people don't really have any interest in relationships, they're not all about it, they don't have much emotion to show. And it's a title where people seem like quite uncomfortable in them. And you have issues with cognition in terms of like interpreting things correctly and seeing things what they are. Um, and it's worth noting that that's more kind of like a constant baseline of being a bit off as opposed to schizophrenia, which kind of spikes every now and then. Okay, cluster B is a bit more dramatic, um, <laughs> sort of psychopath continuum. Um, and so there are issues with how you treat people or how you deal with how people treat you. So we'll go into borderline a bit, but the other three we'll do first. So antisocial is basically just being a massive dude. So uh, disregarding and violating the rights of others without any remorse. Um, histrionic is when you go, you just go ape shit all the time. And then narcissistic is where you think you're awesome again, which we've already talked about a bit. Oh, the cluster C tends to be some kind of anxious one. So you get avoidant, which is where people feel kind of inadequate. They don't like it when you, well, I know one likes it when you criticize it, but they like really can't deal with it. Uh, dependent is where people are dependent on each other. So they get really submissive and they'll cling to others because they want them to be take, basically want to be taken care of. And then OCD, you all have heard of, basically just like really all about being orderly, control, perfectionist, all that kind of stuff. Oh yeah. Borderline, so basically the only word you really need to know from here is the word instability, because literally everything about it is about some kind of instability. So uh, these are, this is why I was saying to try and try and get a feel for them rather than memorizing the lists, because basically all the things here seem like something that someone would do if they were quite unstable. So they might be worrying about abandonment, they might have instability, whoa, instability in their affects, like their mood, um, unstable relationships, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay. So then, as far as causation goes, um, things like trauma, uh, temperament, which is basically just like the way you, the way you are, um, genetics and neurological issues, and then that's just a few different therapies. Um, <laughs> mindfulness. To be honest, mindfulness is like you can call it a therapy for most things. So if in doubt, go for it. <coughs> um, anxiety. I mentioned before that. It's mostly only a problem if it starts affecting function. It's, it is a normal emotion until then. Um, as characterized by people feeling like massive apprehension and fear, which usually isn't really um, proportional to the problem that they're going to face. Uh, and then the somatic symptoms that can come with it are kind of like an SNS or sympathetic nervous system responses. So I like resting heart rate, feeling breathlessness, sweating, that kind of stuff. And it makes people basically avoid doing things they normally do. Okay. Um, so these are just kind of what sort of things are more common in different parts of people's lives. So most of them I think really fit. Um, separation, anxiety is more common in childhood. Social phobia in adolescence, I like this one, uh, panic and generalized anxiety disorders towards mid-adulthood, which is where we're, we're all going. And then, <laughs> um, and then most of them have low homotypic continuity. And that is a phrase that does come up on your exam, homotypic continuity. And basically all that means is that um, if you have it at some point, if you have high continuity, then you're going to have it for the rest of your life. Low continuity, then you might have it for a few months and then it kind of goes away. Uh, causing treatment, they're all very general, again, because we don't really know what causes them. So most of them are very much guesswork. <coughs> um, 
yeah, CBT, relaxing, and <laughs> pharmacological, so, so drugs. You don't need to worry about specific drugs, though, because you'll do those later as well. Cool. Okay, so here's a whole bunch of different vignettes. And this is like a kind of style that they like to apply either to farm or to HLSD. So they basically just ask like a whole bunch of shotgun questions. So, who wants to go first? Doing very well at not looking at me. Anyone? F. Yeah, little to know. It is F. So the key to this one is the fact that he has little to no interest and he doesn't seem to give a shit. That's basically it, yeah? And he's not having any delusions, so it's not going to be schizophrenia. Um, and I think most of the rest don't really make sense for this situation. Yeah. So I like the name John, so I continue with that. Um, so here's a different example. Battery. <laughs> Feel free to uh, call it out if you get it. Where is it housed? <laughs> What do you think? Yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty obvious, right? This is very antisocial. Yeah? If, I heard some people saying F. So the difference between this one and the previous one is that this one is about them basically trying to break rules. Like, they're going out of their way to do it, and they don't feel bad about it, which is different to the previous one where it's like, I don't care, I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah? So one is a lot more kind of, you can, it's not really aggressive, but you can think of it that way. Okay. Next one. What are John in these? Yeah, no, 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 no. Are you? Yeah. Simple. Yeah. Cool. Uh, for anyone who wasn't looking, it's anxiety, obviously, because he's anxious, he's worried, breathless, apprehension, all the kinds of words you associate with someone who's quite anxious. Okay, we're back to the first John. So. I had quite a change of heart in the, over the time of the last couple of questions. Yeah, borderline. Yeah, because it's all it's all kinds of stuff that again it seems very unstable. So things like uncomfortable jokes about self harm, getting very angry, then going straight feeling sorry, things like that. Yeah. Is that good? Uh, it's just oh, two time nature. All right. Um. So I believe you do actually come this as well. So. Get going. Suicide is just a pathway. Um, learn the steps of it because it's really just like a step by step way to end up with a suicide attempt. Uh, pretty sad, but yeah. Uh, it's This one actually, unlike a lot of them, where it's kind of like a bit more towards one gender than the other, it is worth knowing that it's far more common in males than females. Um, that's the framework. So, let it go. Um, normal aging, you might remember as an extremely long lecture, but in only an hour, uh, with about a thousand slides, which nobody can, like, it doesn't come up, it just doesn't. Um, so the general stuff you can really do based on just understanding what happens when you get old. So obviously, you're more likely to get disease. You're going to have less reserves in your ability to kind of exert yourself. Um, a greater risk of, do you know what cascade iatrogenesis is? Anyone? All right, so basically what it is, is you go into hospital for one thing, and then 600 other things happen to you while you're there, and so you end up with 600 new diseases. And a lot of time, obviously, it's not great. So this is the example. So you turn up with fractured pelvis, you spend ages on a trolley, so you get a pressure sore, you get morphine, you get delirious, 
constipation, you might fall over, break your femur as well, uh, you might get renal failure, you might stay in hospital for longer, and there's all kinds of crap. So again, no need to learn a specific pathway, but just to know that it's a thing. Going into hospital is a great way to stay in hospital. Physiological changes, definitely don't bother with them. I mean, it's like eight marks and none of them are gonna be about this. Maybe have a look at these if you're interested, but most of them will make sense. These are the only ones that maybe won't. Um, yeah. Okay, delirium. Um, so this is another specific kind of state that you can be in. It's not really a condition, it's a state like being fatigued or being agitated, things like that. So you have confusion, hallucinations, inattention. So that's when you're talking to people and it'll kind of like zone out and zone back in halfway through your next sentence. Uh, agitation, altered consciousness, and then the other stuff at the bottom, like different uh, fluctuating mental status and disorganization of thinking, are more generalized. Cool. Frailty, um, again, kind of the concept of it. So basically, it's the idea of you becoming less able to do what you used to do over time. Um, it's because of uh, basically gradual drops in a whole bunch of different systems. So that can include things like uh, weight loss, slowness, weakness, uh, crap endurance, and not much mobility. And then uh, increase in frailty, so where more of your systems are getting worse and worse, uh, predictive of issues like falls, reduced mobility, hospitalization, and then death at the end of it. Yeah, this is the frailty scale. Don't worry about learning all nine of them. This is just to illustrate the progression that you go through. So you start off being quite fit, then if you move down to mildly frail, it might be a bit slower, but they can still kind of get around. Um, then moderately frail, they're starting to get care. Severely frail, might be able to walk. And terminally ill, for some reason, sitting up when the last guy was sitting down. But basically, this is, you're probably going to die in the next six months. Okay. Death and dying. Awesome. Um, I don't think you guys will have to do too much on this. Uh, brain death, don't worry about how to uh, determine it. Put that in because I was worried I wouldn't have enough to say. Um, shouldn't need to worry about that. This is, again, a very kind of touchy-feely area of HLSD. So this is back to how people experience death. Uh, not their own death, but someone else's death. Um, so it'd be like how quickly it is, when they're expecting it, how old the person was, things like that. Okay, uh, types. So this is just the different uh, categories, I guess, you can group them into. So sudden and unexpected is like that, and it's usually not something people are looking out for. Sudden and unexpected can be if someone's old, because it's obviously going to be at four hopefully the sudden event, but you're kind of expecting it if grandma's you know, 110. And then long than expected is things like cancer, um, which tend to lead to more kind of progressive degeneration over time. Okay, stages, um, probably seen at least some of these stages before, so denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Um, yeah, I think you should know. You should know about those, um, even if you're not sure too into them. Yeah, so the surprise question, I don't know if you guys have mentioned it to you, but it's like, would I be surprised if the patient in front of me was to die in the next year? And for some reason, people who said no uh, made the patient seven times more likely to die in the next year. So a lot of the time, if you're thinking someone's going to die, they probably are, is basically the point of the surprise question. Yeah. So, and this last point about trajectories is the idea that um, basically because old people have less... Um, they have less reserve to work through, their drop is more slow than someone who's young and has plenty of things going away from that. Okay, bereavement. Um, cool. Yeah, so bereavement is uh, it's meant to be normal and like everything else, it only becomes abnormal if it goes on for too long or it starts affecting people's lives. So morbid grief is the term that we use for it. Um, so it lasts basically too long and too high a level. Um, and basically people aren't adapting to it. So that means people aren't doing things like acknowledging that it really happens. So they might refuse to believe that someone died. They might not have worked through it. So even like mentioning the name or like seeing a picture, rather than just kind of like getting a pang, they might just burst into tears every time. And they probably haven't adjusted to a new environment without whoever it was who died. Okay, voluntary assisted dying, uh, you'll do a bit more on it next year as well, uh, is worth knowing about. The doctrine of double effects is quite good as well. Uh, basically from, Halfway through next year, uh, that's the bill that the voluntary assisted dying act will be passed in Victoria, um, which means that it's okay to carry out euthanasia. 
Um, and in theory, you should only be allowed for people who are capable, so they can make decisions themselves, and they should be able to um, be making it themselves. You can't have family members asking for it or anything like that. Um, and the idea of the doctrine of double effect is basically if an action you take is going to have two outcomes, as long as the good one that comes first is the one that you need to do and it's proportional to the bad, it's okay to bring about that bad one as well. So the, the idea of this is like relieving the pain by giving, uh, the example, like giving a lot of morphine to someone to relieve the pain. Because you relieve the pain before the morphine kills them. You're not intending to kill them, you're intending to relieve their pain. And the relief of pain is good, then you're allowed to do that. Not legally, yeah, but like, just on an ethical level. Okay, uh, advanced care planning is a very like legalistic kind of thing. Basically, it's just a way to uh, write down what patients want before they die, so that when they do, uh, so they'll die before they lose capacity, so then later they can have treatment decisions made that align with what they wanted. Um, going against it is a bad idea. Uh, it's battery, especially if it's like, quite clearly laid out, so you're very careful with those. Uh, yeah, that's all. So good luck. Thanks for staying.